Now call the October 15th Michigan City City Council meeting to order. And before we stand for the Pledge of Allegiance in a moment of silent prayer, I just want to read and reemphasize the uh, rules and decorum for the Michigan City City Council. Section 255, the presiding officer shall preserve order and decorum at the council meetings and shall decide all questions of order without debate, subject to the appeal to the Council. Section 2-59, the presiding officer may entertain comments from people in attendance regarding any ordinance or resolution under consideration after each reading and prior to the Council comments and debate. People in attendance must be allowed to comment on the topic of a legally required public hearing. The presiding officer may set reasonable limits on the length of the time each person is allowed to speak on an item, but not less than three minutes. The presiding officer shall enforce order and rules during period of public comment, and three minutes will be the time limit to speak during public comment. In case of any disturbance or Disorderly conduct, the presiding officer shall and has the power to require the chamber to be cleared. And proper decorum at meetings is to act professional and respectful to all city officials, whether at the meeting or not. In foul language or directly cussing during the meeting will not be tolerated. With that being said, we will now stand for a Pledge of Allegiance in a moment of silent prayer. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Ms. Silo, roll call, please. Mr. Beatry? Present. Ms. Carnes? Present. Mr. Dabney? Present. Mr. Fitzpatrick? Present. Mr. Hamilton? Present. Mr. Prezbolinski? Don Prezbolinski? Present. Mr. Paul Prezbolinski? Present. Mr. Simmons? Present. And Mr. Stemley? Present. We have nine present and no one absent. Thank you, Ms. Silo. And we all got a copy of the uh, previous council meeting minutes. Is there a motion to approve? Or so move. Support. Motion to approve the minutes and seconded by Councilman Dabney on the vote. Ms. Nyla? All in favor? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Minutes are approved. Reports of standing committees. Councilman Dabney? All right. <clears throat> Tonight's finance committee uh, meeting was called to order at 6.09 p.m. by uh, Chairman Dabney to review claims filed since our last meeting. Committee members Fitzpatrick and Dabney were present, uh, as well as council members Carnes, Beatrice, Simmons, and Stimley. City Controller Rich Murphy was also in attendance. Uh, claim, claims reviewed totaled $102,608.87 from the Riverboat Fund and $15,792.65 uh, from the Boyd Development Fund for a total docket of $118,401.52. Uh, there were no other outstanding uh, issues to discuss, and uh, Councilman Patrick Fitzpatrick, I'm sorry, moved to uh, recommend approval of the docket with a second by Councilman Dabney. Uh, the motion was approved, and the docket was approved um, unanimously. On a motion also made by uh, Councilman Fitzpatrick and a second by Councilman Dabney, the meeting was adjourned at 6:10 p.m. Summary of the claims are as follows: uh, from the Riverboat Fund, Highs and Associates LLC. $24,760 even. Global Engineering and Land Surveying, $62,951.25. Enterprise Rent-A-Car, $1,109.52. 1 
SHE of Indiana LLC, $13,788.10 for a total from the Rubble Fund of $102,608.87. From the Boyd Development Fund, Access LaPorte County Inc., $75. Corporate Payment Systems, $77.07. The News Dispatch, $1,038 even. And We Create Media, $14,602.58. Uh, total from the Boyd Development of $15,792.65. And that brings us once again to a total claims docket of $118,401.52. And that concludes the Finance Committee uh, minutes. Thank you, Councilman Dabney. Uh, I don't believe there's any reports of special or select committees this evening. Uh, reports of other city officers and departments. And first is Megan Henning. NIPSCO Project Communication Specialist, and she's going to, I believe, update us on the Transmission Upgrade Project. Good evening. Um, Megan will be joining here shortly, but I'd just like to take a moment to introduce myself. My name is Denise Conlon, and I happen to be the new Public Affairs Manager here in Michigan City. So as Megan um, goes through, Megan and John go through the overview of the transmission project. If there are issues that arise, um, I will be the point of contact for NIPSCO for, during that time. Um, so I'd like to thank you all for allowing us to come here tonight and share the information about the project we have going on. Um, Megan is in charge of our customer communications for all major projects and with me also I have John Sabotnik the uh, major projects manager who oversee will be overseeing the work going on. So at this time, I'd like to invite John and Megan up. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is John Sabotnik, um, manager of the major projects group at NIPSCO. I uh, wanted to come talk to uh, everyone today in regards to the project that we have. Uh, we're starting up here shortly. Uh, the purpose of the project, uh, as you as you can see on the sh on the sheet here, it's a uh, transmission upgrade here in Michigan City and also in Laporte County. It's tied to ensuring the future reliability uh, of our uh, 138 kV uh, electric system, uh, and it also supports the retirement of our coal fire generation stations by 2028. Uh, was part of the project. Uh, we have uh, we're going to be replacing uh, from Michigan City Gen Station all the way to Bosserman Substation. Uh, 52, approximately 52 electric transmission lattice towers uh, and replacing those with steel monopoles. Uh, we're also going to be doing a little bit of work at the substations as well, both Michigan City um, at the Gen Station, uh, Trail Creek, as well as uh, Bosserman. <coughs> It'll be a total of about nine miles uh, in length and uh, it's replacing the existing conductor and the structures as well too, the support for great capacity. Project is actually uh, starting uh, this month. Uh, we just awarded the contract not too long ago to Michaels Corporation, and they'll be uh, mobilizing as early as next week. Um, it's going to last until May of, uh, of next year, and then uh, shortly after May, we will be uh, performing some restoration on the uh, on the right of way. So some sorry, do you want to, oh, okay. So some of the things to expect as far as part of the construction. Uh, there, there will be some uh, some fences that will be put up, uh, some barricades as well too. Uh, there will be some road closures along the way as well too, and we have a full schedule that was supporting that, and we'll share with all of the fire, EMS, police, uh, and anybody else that would be uh, interested in having that information. Um, then uh, there will be no service interruptions as part of this. It's all on the larger uh, transmission towers. Uh, as I mentioned before, the restoration will then complete um, it will start, I should say, in summer and complete uh, by the fall of next year. So all, all the work is done within our utility right away between Michigan City and um, the Boston substation. So, yeah, I mean, so we're all within our utility right away between Michigan City and Bosserman, so we're not going to be um, doing construction inside Michigan City proper. Um, we did meet with Michigan City officials and Mayor Mir a few weeks ago and presented the project as well, and we're going to be coordinating work with emergency responders um, with Michigan City as well as LaPorte County. The only other thing to add real quick, uh, the contractors that will be working on the right-of-way uh, all of them, as indicated right below the map here, uh, will have uh, uh, all 
you know, all the vehicles will be marked, and they'll also have photo IDs. Uh, Megan's going to go through here in a second uh, some of the communication aspects of that that we're working with the contractors. And if uh, any of the residents do have any questions, we're going to have not only NIPSCO support out on site there, but also the contractors to be fully uh, informed of what's going on with the project, too. So I'll turn it over to Megan for the rest of the communications. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, in regards to customer communications, um, We've already started communicating to customers that are along the right of way, or that are will be um, in be able to see the truck traffic coming in and out. Um, and they have received a postcard in the mail, just informing them that there's a project on the way um, that to prepare be prepared for construction. And then about two weeks ago, they should have received this fact sheet in the mail as well, with the detailed information on that. Um, this fact sheet is also on our website. So residents can go to nipsco.com backslash projects and go under LaPorte County, and it would be under transmission upgrades. It's really easy to find. Um, we also have our customer care center, 1-800-4-NIPSCO, which um, you can call in 24 hours a day, anytime, to get additional information on the project. Um, if there are, are specific concerns that a customer has or a resident has on the project, um, those will then be tracked back out to the project team and we can reach out to them directly. Um, but, you know, as I mentioned, we're going we're to be in communication with Michigan City officials throughout the duration of this project with updates on schedules, timelines. Um, we're working with emergency responders. We have, our, we have safety meetings every morning that emergency responders are going to be invited to. Um, any time that they would like to attend. Okay. Sir, any questions? <laughs> Are there any questions from the council members? Uh, yes, Councilman Prisbinski. Thank you. Um, are these towers, are they uh, generated and uh, made with U.S. Uh, steel and uh, made in the States? You're referring to the steel structures that yeah. are going to be going up. Right. Uh, the steel structures are, are made with NAFTA uh, steel, and uh, they are being manufactured in uh, in Mexico. However, all the steel rebar cages and also all of the um, uh, anchor bolt cages were manufactured here in the U.S. with U.S. steel as well. And any all of the conductor uh, that's being utilized here is being manufactured uh, in here in the U.S., as well as all of the hardware that's associated with the uh, structures. Any other questions? Yeah. Councilman Fitzpatrick? Uh, yeah, I got a quick one. Um, if any of the, you said the work that you're going to be doing is going to be in your construction, I mean, in the right-of-way. So if there is an event where it is close or encroaches on someone's private property, what are the plans to deal with that? To communicate out about the project, or what are you asking, I, I guess? So you're going to be replacing the poles that are there, right? Correct. We're going to be, um, well, foundation work is going to start in October, <coughs> the end of October. We're going to be coming in um, and laying the foundations for the new monopoles between October and March. And then in January, we're going to start retiring the, the old towers and executing the new ones. Um, there are some areas in Michigan City where, you know, there are residents where, yeah, their property is going to back up to our, their, our, the utility easement, um, and they've been notified of the project. So they've received this fact sheet. Um, they've received the postcard. Um, if there are specific residents that are going to be impacted, like say they have something that encroaches on the utility easement, um, our land department has reached out to them directly, and we've already been having conversations about the project. Uh, I guess that question. sort of answers it, other than the postcard, but you haven't made an attempt to directly contact residents that would be impacted by this. We're not going door to door and talking to people about the project. Because usually if something like that does occur, they'll start calling us. Sure. They've received, well, they've received the fact sheet with all the detailed information in regards to the project. Via so we're not, we're not going to be working on anyone's property or in our utility easements with this. Like, for example, we have projects that are like underground cable work where you're like, you're on the property. We're removing fences. We're, um, you know, having to access their property multiple times throughout the duration of the project. We will not have to, we have, don't anticipate having to access residents' property to mm -hmm. execute this project. Okay. Thank you. 
Any other questions from the council members? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your time. You're welcome. Next, we have Mr. Michael Cuss, Sanitary District General Manager, to speak to the council about partnerships, the key to pollution prevention and environmental stability, sustainability. Um, thank you very much, uh, President Presbolinski, for the opportunity to present this presentation today to the um, City Council in the City of Michigan City. I'm going to try to turn my uh, the podium this way just a little bit, and I'll try not to laser point your eyes out if I have to do any laser pointing, although, you know, if it slides over to the left, then that's, I'm not going to worry too much about that. Um, this is a presentation that I gave at the uh, annual uh, pollution prevention conference in Indianapolis this year. Um, the um, the theme of the presentation was, uh, what's your story? What have you got done for pollution prevention and partnerships? How are you partnering to get things done? So I put this presentation together for that. It was very well received. Uh, when I got done speaking at the, um, at the conference, uh, several people were just amazed at everything that's getting done here in Michigan City. And, of course, we couldn't do any of that without the support of the, of the city council, that's for, for sure. And um, a couple people were saying that we've got to take this presentation around the state and, and even nationally to show everything that's getting done here in Michigan City. So I asked uh, uh, Mayor if he'd like me to give this at one of the Sanitary District Board meetings, and he suggested that I... Uh, talk with uh, President Presbolinski about presenting it here, so that's what I'm here to do. So, again, I just want to reiterate that this is geared towards an audience, maybe more in Indianapolis. Um, okay, partnerships, again, is the key to environmental sustainability and pollution prevention. And a partner, a partner is someone who shares or is associated with another person in some endeavor. We use this word a lot, but sometimes we forget what a partner really means. A partnership also equals teamwork, okay? These are some slides about teamwork, you know, building the little bridge to get over to success and putting the pieces of the puzzle together. <clears throat> a team is two or more people working together with cooperation between those who are working on a task. Okay, so we're all working together. You know, I often say to me the greatest play in all of sports, if you guys like sports, is a sacrifice bunt, you know, because you're giving yourself up for the betterment of the team, you know, and that you don't see that a lot in the real world. A lot of people want to take credit for everything, but sometimes when you're on a team, you got to do your job. Uh, teamwork is the willingness of a group of people to work together to achieve a common goal. And I really like that one. It shows the puzzle fitting together. And this is another one I found. Together, everyone achieves more if you work on a team. Together, everyone achieves more. And the next one is uh, Attorney Meyer's all-time favorite, and that is working together really works. Okay, And that's one that he always tells us, and I know a lot of people have heard that before. So... Um, then again, the theme of the conference was partnering for environmental success, or partnering for environmental progress, what's your story? And so I made up this thing here. This is our story. Once upon a time in a land far up north along the southern shores of Lake Michigan, there was a place called Michigan City. Now mind you, when you're down in Indianapolis, this is pretty far up north for these folks. And I actually purposely put this little picture in here that shows Michigan, Wisconsin, Illinois, and Indiana in there because I wanted them to think like that. And then this town had a nice, friendly mayor who was loved by all, and his first order of business was to issue a proclamation to all the land. And on January 12th, he wrote this proclamation, Hear ye, hear ye, effective immediately. All departments will work together for the common good, and we are one team working for common goals, and we will seek out new partnerships to help us achieve our goals. And then I had some slides in there to show Michigan City. Obviously, that's the beachfront. That's our iconic sunset. Uh, this is... Uh, Trail Creek looking over the, through the drawbridge. This is our harbor. This is another picture with uh, Millennium Park with the beautiful fountain. And then, of course, this is what it looks like in the wintertime. But also, Michigan City is also this. It's a very urban area, and it's a, a blue-collar area, and we need to make sure that we also focus on those needs. So that's why I added this slide. And then this is just an overview slide here showing Lake Michigan. Of course, this is Trail Creek, which winds through the city. And it's important to kind of see that as, as I go through more of these slides. Um, these are our partners. I'm going to read these. It's kind of a long list, but it really demonstrates how we work together. The Lead Committee, the State Department of Health, the U.S. Housing and Urban Development, August Mack, Environmental Incorporated, the Redevelopment Commission, Blue Shadley, Rachel Braun, uh, James Meyer Associates, the Indiana Department of Environmental Management, 
DCA Environmental Consultants, the Energy Service Group, NIPSCO, Indiana University, the Sustainability Commission, Ozinga, DLZ, the University of Illinois at Chicago, uh, A2LA Laboratory Accreditation, Group 7 Laboratory Services, the Blue Swag Group, Purdue University, the Department of Natural Resources, the Army Corps of Engineers, Weaver Consultants, the Alliance for the Great Lakes, the Delta Institute, V3 Engineers, and GEF, and the last slide, the National Fish and Wildlife Federation, Sustain Our Great Lakes Program, the Great Lakes Commission, Western Environmental Action Council, uh, the Partners for Clean Air Program, Grand Valley State, the Trail Creek Watershed Group, and other local partners that include Hassan Associates, John Doyle Associates, American Structure Point, Global Engineering, uh, Seobra Engineering, SHE, the Smith Group, and Jones and Henry. So those are some of our partners. So now I'm going to talk about six programs at the city at the city level, and the first one is the Lead Committee, then Bagley Cleaners, Brownfields, Energy Project, Greenhouse Gas, and the Sustainability Commission. Okay, Lead Committee and Lead Safe Michigan City Abatement Program. In January 2017, um, there was a proactive approach for addressing lead contamination and impacts that has on low-income families and minority families at an alarming rate. And we're the only city in the state of Indiana that has such a committee, and two of your council members are on this, are on this committee. The mayor said, although we're confident that our drinking water is fine, it's vitally important that our citizens have knowledge and the resources at their disposal should they want to find out further about the potentials of lead and if they have any concerns. The lead committee is a working committee. It's here to educate the community and it's here to provide awareness. The members of the committee are myself as the chairman. The mayor called me on the phone and said, I'm starting this committee and guess what? You're in charge of it. I said, okay, thank you. <laughs> Deb Chubb, who is a, a Michigan City Area Schools board member and private consultant, uh, Council President Don perez Bolensky. Chris Johnson from the Water Department, uh, Rob Johnson from the Michigan City Social Justice Group, Sue Dallas from the Planning Department, Albert Dean Allen from the Minority Health Partners of LaPorte County, Kimberly Williams is a local pastor, Sean Fitzpatrick is a council member, Dan McCoy is a safety consultant that helps us at the Sanitary District, and of course Sherry Wilson is the redevelopment uh, and CDBG and HUD grant coordinator. And what are the effects of lead? In adults, it can cause abdominal and digestive issues. But in children, doctors say there's no safe level of lead, none at all that is good for children. The current action level is 5 micrograms per deciliter, very small amounts. Um, and this is another thing you'll hear a lot of times, that pregnant women don't have to worry about it, but they can transfer it to their fetus. That is something that people will try to tell you that's not true, but it definitely, if you're a pregnant woman, you definitely do not want to be around any lead or anything and this is a graph that shows the crime rate, violent crimes in the U.S., and how they correspond to the lead uh, that we have in our society overall. Um, the greatest source of lead is the lead-based paint, and basically it comes from older homes because in 1978 they, uh, they banned the use of lead-based paint. And lead uh, had a lot of different reasons why they used it, but one of the reasons is it was more durable. But the fine dust from the lead-based paint can be inhaled or digested, it can weather and go off the outside of your house, and if you're playing in the soils, you can get it in your system, especially if you're a child, along the drip lines of the house especially. The housing stock in Michigan City, about 76% of the housing stock in Michigan City was built before 1978, so there's considerable potential here. Uh, this is some of the things we've gotten done. I'm not going to read the whole list, but we've had over 40 meetings. We've sent out over 30,000 educational flyers. We've met with state legislatures. We've had presentation of outreach to churches. Uh, we've sent letters to schools asking them to test their water. We've had outreach to area schools. And we've secured participation in the Indiana Lead Program. And then we also uh, secured the $2,300,000 uh, lead grant. Um, drinking water. Um, this is something that I really have to put in here. I really have to commend the Michigan City Area Schools. When we sent that letter to them, they took it. Uh, to heart, and they had every single one of their drinking water fountains tested, and all their sinks and every faucet in every building tested for lead. And uh, any problems that they found, which were only a couple, they remade, they shut those off, and then they fixed it. What else? What the problem was was actually with the fixtures themselves were getting the lead into the water. And then they also started a program where they're testing the kids before they go to school, and they're the only school in the state of Indiana that is doing this program and I really have to commend them for for this work mm -hmm. and some people might say well 
You're supposed to be tested when you're younger, and by the time you get in school, you might be five or six years old or even four, but the testing can be done before that. You can do it when they're young, but even if you haven't been tested, it's still good to get tested, and a lot of these children have siblings and stuff like that. So I think it's a really good program. The state of Indiana had a program for grants, but the only cities that were eligible were East Chicago, Evansville, South Bend, Indianapolis, and Gary. And Don and Sean know from our groups, we were always wanting to know, how can we get in this program? How come we can't be part of this program? So we kept bugging them and bugging them with persistence on how we got admitted to the club, and they finally let us in. And what this does is it covers um, any lead abatement in your house. It's 100% of the cost, and you can get applications on the website or from the district. And today, Michigan City had over 30 applicants, which is more than any other city in the state of Indiana, uh, even though we got into the program late. Now, I also understand recently that they've kind of maxed out their amount, and so they're going to try to, any new applicants we're going to try to uh, do with this HUD program. Uh, as I know everyone on the council knows, we received a $2 million grant uh, from, from HUD to look at the lead hazards, and that comes along with a $420,000 cash match from the city of Michigan City, okay? That is huge, and that really shows that the mayor and the city council are putting their money, you know, where their mouth is by saying, look, we're going to give back to the community this money to help out where these lead hazards are so we can help protect the children. We also received a $300,000 grant for healthy homes, and there's no match required for that. So the total amount of money that we'll have to spend on these programs is $2,720,000. And I might uh, slow down for a second. The lead... Uh, prior is only for remediating lead, and, and it's only for lead-based paint. They are thinking about expanding this program in future grants to look at water issues, although I don't think we have too big a problem with that, if any problem at all, in Michigan City with the water. Uh, but the Healthy Homes is, looks at everything from mold to drafty windows and different things along those lines. So it's more of an overall health of your home. Um, and we've uh, called this project Lead Safe Michigan City. The focus area is basically all of Michigan City. But we want to have emphasis on the neighborhoods that have the highest incident of childhood lead poisoning where there's the greatest risk. Um, the project goal is to make 120 units lead safe. Hopefully we can protect over 105 children. We'd like to screen 1,500 children through lead testing and train residents, train six residents, excuse me, as certified community health workers and train 360 individuals in either lead safe uh, cleaning practices or lead safe work practices. And that's really another important part of this grant is that we're going to also take people who are construction workers, contractors, and we're going to be going to those people and we're going to be saying, look, this is how you need to do this work so you don't cause problems. And then also these six certified community health workers, they'll be able to go out through the community and help people understanding the problems with lead. So it's more than just fixing the homes. Um, we're going to assist 30 Section 3 eligible individuals. We're going to hopefully conduct a bunch of outreach events and the healthy homes. We're hoping to hit 90 homes on that. And we're hoping to, at the end to create a lead safe housing registry program so that if you're interested in looking for a house to rent or a house to buy, you could go online and you could say this house has been certified as lead safe. And we're thinking that will really go a long way. So. Um, as some of the benefits of lead is that uh, for every dollar spent, you get $1.17 in return. That's from Dr. Jacobs. And when you put enforcement into the mix, he's saying that it's for every dollar spent, you get $3 in return. And Mother Jones, which is a, a think tank organization, they're saying that for every dollar you spent, when you factor in the crime reduction, because the, as, as time goes on, uh, people will be more cognitive and they won't ha get into crime, and for every dollar you spent, you're going to get a $10 in return. So that would be really huge if all this money, this $2 million, could, could get back to that. That would be a nice figure of $20 million for Michigan City. The next thing I want to get into now is the Bagley Cleaners. Uh, I'm going to go through some of this a little quicker than I did in Indianapolis because you guys know most of this, but uh, this, the Redevelopment Commission uh, bought the property at uh, was it 11th and the Boulevard. Uh, they were aware of the contamination. But as we looked into it a little more, we found that the uh, perchloroethylene was, was into the groundwater. Uh, these are the partners that are working on that. The area affected, we thought it was a limited number of homes. However, in an abundance of caution, we want to notify all the residents, 64 in total, residents, homes, I should say, not more people live in the homes, in a four-block area. And this is the area right here where um, 
the property that the city purchased and this was about the point where the leak started and it was going this way traveling towards Trail Creek and this is where the purple is where the heaviest contamination was found and then the blue lines are the next highest and then the green is is a little higher than that and then what we did though was we could have according to state regulations we sorry I guess I gotta be the microphone according to state regulations we could have only went 100 feet outside of that but we decided to notify everybody in this four block area here and Mr. Meyer I want you to know that this includes the whole block okay the whole four block area me and Mr. Meyer are going around today about the definition of a block um, <laughs> the city is not the responsible party, but we took a proactive approach and we voluntarily, uh, out of concern for public health and public welfare of its residents, we instituted a sampling program. A sampling program <coughs> was um, two rounds of vapor intrusion testing. One was conducted in August through November of 2018 and the other one was in February of 2019. All the sample results of the indoor air turned out to be below any immediate action levels, and all indoor quality screenings were below the levels, with the exception of two uh, residents that showed slightly above screenings, but oddly enough, there was nothing underneath the subsurface in those. So it was a little bit interesting, and one of the houses was actually a vacant home, so uh, we think there must just be something in the house. You had to identify all the chemicals that were in your home and everything before you did this testing. <coughs> This is a quote from Mayor Mir. It says, I'm uh, extremely proud of my staff for quickly implementing this work and their dedication to health and well-being of the residents of the community. Uh, and he hopes that my administration will continue to react quickly to take the necessary steps to ensure the safety of our residents. And as long as I'm the mayor, he says, we will continue to be a leader in the area of public health, safety, and hopefully, and this is a big key, hopefully other communities throughout Indiana can look towards Michigan City as a strong example of where such efforts are creating positive results. I don't know how many of you are, are familiar with what's going on in Franklin, Indiana right now, or has been going on, but they've got some major issues down there in Franklin, Indiana, and had their leaders of their city taking these types of efforts right off the bat, I don't think they would have had those problems. Now I want to move on to the Brownfields Coalition. Um, we got a grant, $600,000 grant. Um, these are the partners. What is a brownfield? It's a property uh, that's suited for expansion or reuse and could be complicated by the presence of hazardous materials. Uh, this is what a brownfields will do. This is our inventory map. Um, doesn't really quite call the whole city, but everything on here that's shaded in a color are the areas that we had on the Brownfields program. So you can pretty much see it's pretty much most of the areas of the city and certainly most of the more urban areas. We're hoping to create job creation, clarifies environmental condition. Um, so that, that's the Brownfields grant. We're moving along with that pretty well. Uh, quite frankly, our consultants say that uh, the city of Michigan City is moving quicker than any consultants that they, any city they've worked with on such a program. Uh, the city also in, went for this energy savings project. There's 12 projects that include heating and ventilation, lighting, and solar panels. Um, there's also the green gas, uh, greenhouse gas admissions report that was called the Michigan City Resilience uh, Cohort. Uh, this was a program that was ran through uh, IU. Uh, it was established in 2019. And, oh, this is the Michigan <laughs> City Sustainability Commission. Sorry, I'm going too fast. And that was established in 2019. Uh, the first meeting was in May. Um, the chair of that is Adalia Zegas. And uh, the purpose of the Sustainability Commission is to coordinate communication, perform outreach, and provide information. I advocate for con uh, conservancy of energy, encourage recycling, and uh, assure comprehensive sustainability program in Michigan City. Now, these are the projects we're going to talk about for the Sanitary District. Uh, this is just some information on the district, what we do. Uh, storm sewers, legal drains, ditches, refuse pickup. Uh, guiding principles, environmental stewardship, sustainability, and pollution prevention. Start out with the compressed natural gas. We have two 40 horsepower compressors. We have seven CNG fueled trucks, four refuse CNG fueled trucks, and one CNG fueled sewer cleaning machine. We were the first city in Indiana to have uh, a sewer cleaning machine that ran on natural gas, and the first community in Northwest Indiana to have a CNG refueling station. And again, CNG stands for compressed natural gas. Very good for the environment. Almost you know, no greenhouse gas emissions per se compared to a, a car. We 
We're hoping to reduce VOCs by 179 pounds a year, 614 pounds of carbon monoxide, and 8,090 pounds of carbon dioxide per year. Ozingo was our partner there, and these are some pictures of our of our uh, refueling station. These are the compressors here, the 240 horse compressors, and these are the spheres here. These spheres pump up to 3,600 uh, PSI. So this isn't like 30 PSI or 100 PSI. You put in your tire, you think, okay, you put 50 PSI in your tire, you can't even hardly budget. This is 3,600 PSI. Um, that's just a close-up of the, of the compressor. This is one of the CNG field trucks. Here you see natural gas vehicle. Those are actually, these are actually dual fuel. They can run on uh, gas or CNG. This is our sanitary truck. This is our fueling island that we constructed here. This is our sewer cleaning machine. And then this is a close-up. This is how you hook it up, how you fill it up. You hook this uh, attachment to the vehicle and open the valves and it starts to fill. All right, we have an energy savings project at the sanitary district, $1.8 million with two aeration, new aeration blowers, a chemical feed system, and lighting. Um, nearly every light in Michigan City was changed and most needed new fixtures. This is an example of inside the building, outside fixture, and then that's just a close-up of the LED bulbs. That's what they look like. A chemical feed pump was installed in January 2018. Very simple situation here. It's a peristolic pump. It uses about a half a horsepower to pump the ferrochloride in. And then we installed two new turbine blowers, uh, these are our old blowers here. Pictures of these are positive displacement, super loud. I mean, if you were in there, you couldn't even, you could talk at the top of your lungs, and if someone was standing next to you, you couldn't hear. And this is where we took them out, and then these are the new ones here, these blue ones that are installed. And these things are like whisper quiet. You could stand right next to them, carry on a conversation like no problem at all. That's just another picture of them. That's a close-up. And these are variable speed, too. So we have these hooked up to our DO and our ration tanks. As a DO, uh, it gets higher, we lower the volume of air down or if our DO starts to sag, we increase it. Uh, this was the press release that we had. It's supposed to save us $164,000 annually and we also received a one-time check from NIPSCO for $190,988, so $191,000. Uh, Mayor Mirror says he's very proud of the commitment uh, to the environment and he's happy that we uh, partnered with ESG, NIPSCO, and DLZ in this endeavor. And uh, this is an example of the check that you get for the picture. So they brought this check out, and I'm thinking, wow, this is really cool. We're going to keep this out of the wall, put it up on the wall. It's like one of those, like, things that you wipe out with a crayon, and then you wipe it off. So they take it to the next place. So that was a little disappointing. Maybe they could pump up the program with a, something that you could keep. <laughs> yeah, that would be nice. But it was still nice to get the $191,000. This will save, the project is supposed to save 252 megawatt hours, 832 pounds of sulfur dioxide, 529 pounds of nitrogen dioxide, and 475,000 pounds of carbon dioxide. And then that was the lighting, and the turbo blowers are 1,000 megawatts and 2.3 million pounds of carbon dioxide that they will save annually. Okay. We also got an energy study from the University of Chicago, University of Illinois at Chicago. They talked about four opportunities. Uh, the first one here was to install capacitors. We installed these capacitors on our system. First month saved us twenty five hundred dollars on our NIPSCO bill, just like that, boom. And then this one here, we also did variable speed pumps already. So that was a, a nice and that was a free free energy study. They came in and did the work for free. Uh, we also have this laboratory accreditation. Uh, with the American Association of Laboratory Accreditation and Group 7 Laboratories, who are our, our partners on that. They're from uh, California, helped us get this program going. Uh, we're the only, this is our certificate, and uh, we are the only municipality in the, not, in the state of Indiana that has such accreditation. And what this does is this assures that all of our lab work that we do at our plant is in accordance with the ISO 10725 standard. That's an international standard. So our lab is now at an international standard level and again, we're the only municipality lab in the state of Indiana that has such certification. <clears throat> this is a picture of our of our lab. This is Sue Lehman, who's our uh, lab manager, and this is uh, Katrina and Laura and Sarah. So this is the um, the uh, stormwater advisory group is a uh, swag group. And what it is, is we call it the blue swag. And why do we call it blue? Because blue reminds us of clean water. We meet monthly, and our partners are the planning department, engineering, central services, forestry department. We have private citizens come to this member, city council members come to the member, come to the meeting, sorry. 
and uh, local engineers and also Northwest Indiana quality experts. Purdue also helps us with this. We've got two major accomplishments. That's a land acquisition strategy for um, purchasing land for water reclamation or for greenways and then the Green Street stormwater policy. Um, the tools from the land acquisition strategy have been defined. We have a whole charting program and the uh, green stormwater streets policy. We've got a policy statement and we're working on that. We're going to take that to the Sustainability Commission. Last couple of things is the Carwick dump site is $2.4 million cleanup and the Cheney Run is a $2.1 million project. And only 15% of all this money is from local funding. Uh, those were our partners. This is the Carwick dump site. This is where it's located off of Carwick Road by the Honking Bridge. Uh, this is an overview of the whole area. This is GAF. Uh, this is what the site looked like when we dug a hole back in 2013, just buried with trash 12 feet deep. This is where the trash was leaking out into Trail Creek. This is 2013. We put this stone up here. We built that in 2013 to protect the area. And actually that's, that's hang, hung in there very well. It was still there this year. We redid the uh, sh the shore there. We put up this sort of walking trail, but then we went for final plans to remediate this site once and for all. 2.4 million dollar cost, and all the money was received through uh, work by Plu Shadley and Mr. Meyer was very instrumental in this. And the sanitary district, we had all this money from insurance companies, so there's no tax dollars that are going towards this. We cut all the trees down was the first thing we did along the creek. And as you can see, when we're doing the work, it's still spewing with garbage. This is a little stormwater a curtain that we put along the shoreline. This is another picture of it. This is IDEM came out and did an inspection. They brought, I don't know, six, seven people. This is a trench here that goes all the way along the sh uh, shore of the creek. That clutch collects all the leachate, <coughs> excuse me, so that the leachate's not going out to Trail Creek anymore. For 50 years, this leachate was going out to Trail Creek. That's not happening anymore. It all goes to this pump station and then it gets pumped into the sanitary sewer. This is the clay cap over that leachate trench. This is more of the clay cap. And this is a, what's called a, um, a product to help shore socks is what it's called. They lay this on the shore and then they put mulch inside of it. Uh, and it goes all on the shore to prevent erosion. And this is what it looks like today. It's uh, starting to even see some grass growing in this part here now. And we're trying to keep moving along. Other side of the creek, this is the bridge to nowhere. Uh, not to be confused with Peanut Bridge, but that's the bridge to nowhere. This is the Carwick Cheney Run site. We're hoping to do a stormwater project. This stormwater, all everything in this blue area discharges stormwater out here at the Cheney Run site. It's the largest pipe uh, in Michigan City. It's a 108-inch pipe. You can drive a car in it. It's really big pipe. It comes out right here, and what we're going to do, this is a picture of it. It comes out with this yellowish cast a lot of times. Uh, this is Trail Creek here with the creek coming into Trail Creek, or Chaney Run coming into Trail Creek. But this is what that area looks like out there. So what we're going to do is we're going to put a dam across here on the Chaney Run, and we're going to flood this water and make this water go back in through here, and we're going to enhance and create 10 acres of wetlands in here, and then the water is going to percolate through the ground and treat itself before it goes out to the, to the Chaney Run, uh, or so before it goes out to Trail Creek. Um, We'll be able to treat 37.5 million gallons of, of uh, water a year, and we think we'll be able to keep out 207 pounds of nutrients a year. Um, it's just some stuff on the budget. Great Lakes Emergence Champions Program. It was a mentorship program. I just love this slide. Mentorships are easy. You find a protege, you open up his head, and the smart person puts all the information in there. This is pretty much what like happens every day when Mr. Uh, Meyer comes down to the Sanitary District, Paul. You ought to come down, you know, you up yourself up a little bit here. <laughs> kind of looks like Mr. Meyer there a little bit too, doesn't it? <laughs> and it was a Great Lakes uh, Mentoring Network. And uh, what we did here is we had these quarterly meetings and we opened a discussion with colleagues and mentorships. And there were people all around the Great Lakes, even from Canada, on these meetings. And uh, we learned a lot and we taught them a few things too, I can tell you that. Partners for Clean Air. Uh, Michigan City Sanitary District is a member of Partners to Clean Air. I'd like to invite you all to the May 2020 luncheon. It's free. Oh, sorry. It's free if you want to come to that. But the 2019 luncheon, the award winners was Burns Harbor International uh, Waterway, or Burns Harbor International Harbor and Portage was the commercial winner. The bicycle award went to the bike stop in Michigan City. 
Industrial Award was American Licorice in LaPorte and Michigan City, Indiana for all of our efforts with the environmental stuff and the pollution prevention was the uh, Municipal Award winner. Uh, we also have a, a day at the Steel Yard every year. Last year was August 4th with the Railcats. That's our logo up on the screen. And these are some children. We give a bike away every inning. Every single inning we give one or two bicycles away. So we have these mostly for kids, but sometimes adults too. And they come up and they win these bikes. And boy, then they're riding them around in the concourse and stuff. So why do we give bikes away? Because we want people to be able to, you know, ride their bikes more and not drive their cars. So it helps with pollution prevention. And the Conference on the Environment, we've had that. This will be six years. We've had it for six years. We'll have our seventh year. It'll be next year. Uh, Ulrich from the Great Lakes was our first keynote speaker. Peter Voskowski, uh, Honorable Congressman, was our second year keynote speaker. Paul Labowitz was a third year. George Hawkins, he was the Chief Executive Officer for the Columbia Water and Sewer Authority. And I'm going to tell you right now, when this guy got done speaking, nobody wanted to stay for the rest of the conference. They just wanted to go back to work and start working because this guy was really good. And he had everyone fired up and pretty much go through a wall and go do your work. Uh, Amber McCollum talked, uh, she's a young lady from NASA. Uh, she spoke about how NASA satellites are monitoring the changing Earth. And then Michigan City's own uh, Captain David Rarick spoke last year about his sole circumnavigation around the world. And next year, our keynote speaker is going to be Chad uh, Pagraki, and he was uh, the 2013 CNN Hero of the Year. And what Chad does is he goes around and cleans up waste. He got his start on the Mississippi River out of uh, Moline, and he works out that way, and now he goes all across the country and cleans up waste in rivers and stuff. So I was telling him about what we're doing here in Michigan City, and I hope he's going to come out for a few days before the conference and, and get out on Trail Creek with us. And lastly, I want to talk about the W.G. Jackson. That's something that we've brought in for seven or eight years now. It's a boat out of Michigan, and it's got a full laboratory on board and other equipment that does testing. That's scheduled for June 13th and 14th next year. And um, our partners there are Grand Valley State and, of course, the Trail Creek Watershed Group. Uh, this is a picture of a very packed boat when people are getting on to go out for an excursion on Lake Michigan where we do some sampling. This is a little young lad putting on the life preserver. And that's always something they have to show you before you go out. I always try to find a volunteer. And this is the captain here talking to some of the people on the boat about what they're going to do on the trip. These slides take a little bit to, to flip through. There's a couple of young kids here. Now what this thing here is, this is on a cable. It goes all the way down to the bottom of the lake. We usually go out about a mile, and they drop that all the way down to the bottom, and then it has a little a lever on it that when they release it, it scoops up some of the bottom of the lake, and they crank it back up and then they see what that is. He was telling me they were doing that up near the Straits of Mackinac, and it took 25 minutes for it to get to the bottom because the lake is so deep. And uh, so then the kids look in there, they wash it out, see what kind of things they see. This is inside the boat with the laboratory. Uh, their kids are doing some testing. This is a picture of the boat going out, and a beautiful sunny day on Lake Michigan, Mount Baldy, another picture of the dunes, and then another picture of the, of the children uh, doing some of the testing in the boat. Uh, docked in front of the old lighthouse building there. So when I was in Indianapolis, I said, so that's our story. Through partnerships, pollution was prevented, a clean environment was sustained, and they all lived happily ever after. So that's my presentation, and I appreciate you listening through it. I kind of try to go a little fast, so I hope that was okay. And then if there's any questions from the city council or any comments. Any comments from council members? Council Great presentation. presentation. Um, thank you. I want, I want to thank you uh, for that uh, presentation. It, it, it is overwhelming to see how much stuff, and especially the Cheney Run and that pollution out there by Krigger. Um, on your, this is a question. On your plan to uh, renovate or uh, however you want to discuss it on that Cheney Run watershed, are you planning to make it encompass more, uh, have more capacity to do um, more sewer separation? And I think you know where I'm going. The um, Cheney Run um, would not affect the capacity at all. Uh, the project that we're doing right now, the capacity will not be... Um, 
minimized because of the project that we're doing. They increase the capacity. I mean, you have a 109-inch pipe, and if the water wants to flow out there, believe me, it's going to flow out there. So there's plenty of capacity on the Cheney run. And if you're talking about uh, the Lafayette Barker sewer separation project, that storm water, if we ever implement that project, would go a different way and would go out uh, over by A Street, if that's what you were trying to okay. get at. Okay. All so. right. Thank you. Councilman Dabby? Yeah, um, that was a big presentation, long presentation, uh, a lot of information in that. How do we get a, a copy of that? Is there a way I can get a copy of this? Sure. Okay. Yeah, no problem at all. I'll contact you. Okay, very good. Anything else? Okay, well, thank you again. I, oh. Uh, Councilman Simmons? That was my question. How do we get a copy? Uh, very informative. I wish I had it last night. Sorry. <laughs> Um, I can definitely get get you a copy of it, okay? And I can send it to all of you, or I can put a link in. You guys can download it, whatever you want. But and like I said again, and and I'm not, I'm not. It's so true. When I gave this presentation in Indianapolis, these people were just they they couldn't believe everything that we we're doing, you know. And they were going on and on about it. So I thought it'd be a good opportunity to show you. Yeah, guys. Mr. Cos Councilman Przybonski has another question. Okay. Um, you know, on that presentation, have you thought about giving that to or? Co-oping with the science department with the, at the high school. Or um, not not. I haven't thought about that directly, but we certainly could do that. We definitely with the W G Jackson. Uh, we definitely contact them and try to have them come out. We have tours of our wastewater treatment plant all the time, and they've had some other Earth Day things. We've usually worked with them on those types of things for sure. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah, a couple comments, Mr. Oh, Cuss. Okay. Uh, fantastic presentation. Uh, I know I've been involved with the lead committee, and we have done a lot, a lot of painstaking work. You more so than, you know, myself, because you, you're the director. But uh, a lot of great work, and we are the only city in Indiana that, you know, has gotten some of these funds. I know South Bend's into it. And uh, the other thing I'd like to commend, especially with the uh, Carwick Road trash, dump area, because I remember back in 2013 when that uh, curve gave way, mm -hmm. and the embankment and all the right. trash was going in the, right. yeah, and then you were out there, uh, Jim Michaels was out there, and a bunch yeah. of other fellows from the sanitary yeah. district, and, you know, we came out there to see uh, what was going on. Right, uh, you did. Was there, that was a Sunday afternoon. Yes, it we was. Were, we were out there working all weekend on Sunday. Yeah. We put 250 tons of glacier stone in there. Yeah, and to see what it looks like now is uh, amazing. i got to get out there and take a look at that. So I commend you for that. Well, thank you for your support, too. Yeah, you're welcome. And I also want to thank the uh, council uh, for the vote that we had for the uh, lead committee for the $420,000. Mil or $420,000 million? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, call, I call it myself. I know. $420,000 at the city council uh approved for the uh, lead committee. It's going in, it's going a long way for a lot of good, good for, for the sure. city. So, for sure. yeah. So, anyway, thank you for a great presentation. You're very welcome. And keep up the great I appreciate work, the Mr. opportunity Cross. very much. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Bye. And next, under uh, reports uh, from other city officers and departments, uh, Chief Swistek, I saw him this afternoon, and he asked if he could give his uh, presentation on the IAC uh, evening, funding, Mr. and I said, yeah, you, he could do that under uh, reports of other city officers and department heads, and what, he'll, what he's going to do is when he'll stay, and the sheriff's going to stay, so that if there's any other questions that come up uh, while we're doing the uh, ordinancing, ordinances for the uh, city budget, They'll be here to answer the questions also. Go ahead, Chief. Good evening, Mr. President, members of the Council. Mark Swistek, your Chief of Police. I'd like to take a moment this evening along with our LaPorte County Sheriff John Boyd to share some information with all of the Council and also with the public, both in attendance tonight and at home, in reference to our Digital Forensics Unit, also referred to as our Computer Forensics Unit. Previously, this unit was known as the ICAC Unit, the Internet Crimes Against Children, and it was a funded grant program that assisted with the same things that I'm going to describe to you tonight. So it is no longer described as the ICAC unit. It is now the Computer Forensics Digital Forensics Unit. 
This unit assists um, agencies from the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the GRIT Task Force, all of LaPorte County Law Enforcement, the LaPorte County Prosecuting Attorney's Office. Cases that this unit um, will work on are anything from murder, robbery, fraud, drug investigations, child solicitation, child pornography, burglary, battery, any major felony investigation that we come across. Also, the devices that this unit specializes in, and these are just a few to name many, are phones, cameras, hard drives, SD cards, DVR systems, computers, tablets, iPads, anything that is digitally computerized and technically driven, this unit specializes in that. Um, the sergeant assigned to this unit, Sergeant Matt Barr, has um, extensive training in this area. He's been trained through um, funding by the United States Attorney's Office, funding through the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and he specializes in many areas that um, no other department here in Laporte County can specialize in because of the training that was provided to him. Um, some of the questions, and all of you were forwarded this report that Sergeant Barr had drafted, and I must say it's a very detailed report, and I appreciate the time that Sergeant Barr took to put this report together. But I don't want to belabor that tonight. I don't want to go through case by case. As you can see, there are many cases that um, he had investigated in recent years. What I do want to talk about is the funding that is currently built into the contractual services with the Michigan City Police Department's budget. Currently, you have before you $307,000 and some odd change in contractual services. Um, within that, there are specific licensing and software agreements in there, and I'd like to just briefly go through those couple. One is for Access Data Group, and that is for $17,500 annually. And what this does is this primarily splits all the information, any image, anything that is on a device, on a, a digital device, it separates everything for the investigator. Um, this is anything from um, computer hard drives, SD cards, thumb drives, any type of processing system. This particular um, software and license agreement allows us to do that. The Adobe Creative Cloud Suite for $600 annually. That is to enhance video images. Let's say we have a bank robbery this afternoon and the video is kind of grainy. This particular software allows us to enhance the video here locally and we don't have to send it off to a computer forensics lab we can do it here in-house. Next is the Cellbrite phone forensics um, as it states it is to do with um, information from any phone that can be immediately retrieved by an investigator. So our investigators could be talking to um, an individual that maybe sexually assaulted a child here in our community or maybe committed another heinous crime. Our detectives while they're speaking with the suspect at the time our investigators from this unit can dive into any type of digital device, whether it's a cell phone that we've seized as part of the investigation, we've secured a search warrant to now get into that particular device, we can automatically begin to download information from that and we can share that with the investigators as they are working on the investigation real time. Otherwise, our only other objective is to send it away and it could be months before we get the device back and then would have to go through all the information. Next is the DME Forensics. Um, that is $3,000 annually. That is for DVR systems. It breaks through any type of private DVR system, allows us to get into the DVR system to pull any imaging, any um, audio recordings, anything off of those devices. And again, all of this work is done with court approval through a search warrant with the judge's approval, not just freelancing by our detectives, we go to the prosecutor, we seek a search warrant, and then we dive into these devices. The in-case software, which was um, $650 annually, and the guidance software, which was $640 annually, we have looked at both of those and are prepared to cut that $1,290 from the budget. Um, both of those licensing agreements are not needed because the open text, um, which is the next one for $1,800, the open text allows us to do everything that those two previous agreements had assisted us with. So open text is new. Um, we do like that particular software better. And what open text does is it allows us to get into any type of dead device. Um, if the device isn't active currently, we can now get into the device using this particular. Chief, if, you, if you would, could you repeat 
What, what you just said, that you don't need? We do not need the NK software at $650 annually and the guidance software at $640 annually, which is for a total of $1,290. Both of those can be um, removed from this. I sat down with Sergeant Barr last week. He assured me he no longer needs those and that the open techs for $1,800 annually is, in fact, the software that he will need. Next is the OS Forensics for $500 annually. That is to allow our investigator on scene to determine if the computer is encrypted. He can immediately download any RAM, any type of uh, encryption. Um, maybe somebody's trying to remotely um, shut down the device or that. This particular um, licensing agreement allows him for $500 annually to dive into that um, device right away. So when you look at the total for all of the above um, that I just discussed with you, we're looking at $27,200. Um, some questions have come up in recent weeks about why haven't we shared this cost with other departments. Yes, in fact, we help all law enforcement here in Laporte County and surrounding agencies. Um, but I want to explain that smaller towns, Long Beach and the town of Trail Creek, they do so much for us already that we can't ask them to provide you know, $2,000 a year to assist with this software. It would be very selfish of us. Um, I'll use the example, um, the town marshal, Steve Dick, we recently, this summer, had a walk away from the Indiana State Prison. Steve Dick was out with us. Uh, Marshall Dick was probably out with us for 8 to 10 hours that day, um, working in the heat, providing us with uh, manpower and resources, and we didn't get charged a single dime for that. Um, I'm also asked, well, why don't we bill other agencies, the FBI, the state police, or anyone else that we assist? Um, that same scenario of that inmate that walked away from the prison, we call the Lake, Lake County Sheriff's Department. They brought up the helicopter. They had the helicopter up for the majority of that afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, if I got the bill for that helicopter, it would be enormous. We didn't get billed a single dime for that helicopter. We could call it out tonight if we needed, and again, would not receive any um, billing for that. So with that, um, I would just like to now um, turn it over to the sheriff. The sheriff can explain how the unit was funded this year, um, because as I described earlier, this was a grant-funded program. I can assure this council, as recent as this morning, I was reviewing emails from Assistant Chief Royce Williams. Um, Sheriff John Boyd and I are both aware that we are pursuing actively a grant to continue the support of this unit. Um, we don't know if we're going to be successful with that grant application, but till then, I would respectfully ask that we keep this funding in the budget for 2020 for the Michigan City Police Department until we can find alternative solutions to either split the funding, maybe seek funding from the prosecuting attorney's office, or seek additional um, grant opportunities that will help us offset this cost of $27,000. Again, I'd like to thank uh, LaPorte County Sheriff John Boyd for taking the time to be here with us tonight. Thank you, Chief. Good evening. Uh, to give you a bit of a historical perspective on the former ICAC unit, uh, it was founded several years ago by the former prosecutor, uh, and it was designed to be a countywide task force to assist all law enforcement in LaPorte County. When the new prosecutor took over, that was one of the things that he discontinued, uh, no longer uh, uh, wanted the services of the ICAC unit. I immediately got a telephone call from the Indiana Criminal Justice Institute and their director. Uh, I should uh, say, in interest of full disclosure, I'm also on the Board of Trustees for it as well. So while I couldn't vote for it, uh, I had to recuse myself uh, because it would have been a conflict of interest. Nonetheless, I was involved in the conversation. He was concerned that the uh, prosecutor was wanting to walk away from it, and he said, uh, by the terms of the grant agreement and by Indiana Code, all of the equipment that was uh, initially purchased for the ICAC unit, which was in the amount of uh, a little more than a quarter of a million dollars, would revert back to the, the sheriff of the county, so it would be Laporte County. And if we weren't interested in it, it would go to the, back to the state of Indiana, and it could go anywhere. And, and we really, I talked to Chief Swistak, uh, the chief of the Laporte Police Department at the time, and several of the uh, marshal's offices in Laporte County, and I said, we really want to keep this equipment here. We have somebody that's trained and certified, and uh, heretofore, when we had devices that needed to be downloaded, uh, it, time is of the essence in these investigations. Uh, that works by contacting the Indiana State Police by email and telling them that we'd like to make an appointment to drop off these, this digital equipment uh, for a full forensic examination. They, in turn, would then schedule an appointment for us to bring the evidence to them that was usually about a week and a half out. 
Now you can imagine if we've got a crime scene in which time is of the essence and there's exigency involved, we don't have the luxury of time of waiting for a week and a half to have a, an appointment even scheduled for us to bring the, the equipment in and the evidence. Uh, then we would have to wait uh, on average between six and nine months for there to be a full forensic examination and download to preserve and locate any potential evidence of that crime. So getting back to my original point with the Indiana Criminal Justice Institute, we opted that uh, as the sheriff I wanted to keep the equipment here. It made sense since the ICAC unit had already been located here at the Michigan City Police Department and they have space space that we don't have at the sheriff's office, somebody trained and somebody certified that we would keep the equipment here with the understanding that Sergeant Barr would continue with the uh, digital forensic examinations that he had previously been doing for all law enforcement, uh, whether it be local, state or federal uh, law enforcement here in, in the county. Uh, at, at that point, uh, in talking with the Indiana Criminal Justice Institute, we understood that that grant funding stopped immediately when the prosecutor said he no longer was interested in continuing with the project. Uh, that meant that the funding for all of the, um, the software and the licensing agreements ceased as well. So at that point, we realized when all of the software and licensing agreements uh, expired, uh, we uh, at the Sheriff's Office approached our county council uh, Detective Barr put together a list of all of the software and license agreements that he needed, much like the list that had been provided to you. Uh, we approached the county council and we asked for $26,650 uh, from them in the April 8th uh, meeting, and that passed uh, with a 7-0 vote. And so we provided the funding for the software and the licensing upgrades that were necessary to move it into 2020. And that's where we are today. Those agreements are due to expire uh, right around the first of the year, if I'm not mistaken. I can tell you also that um, probably 85 to 90 percent of all the crimes that we investigate at the sheriff's office have some sort of a digital footprint. When I look at all the cases that Matt Barr has done for our investigators, uh, our investigators do the investigation themselves. Sergeant Barr, through this equipment that he has, through the ICGI, uh, merely uses that as a tool to download and preserve it, evidence and present it. We continue to do the investigation. We're not handing it off to the Michigan City Police Department for them to do that. But I'm really pleased when I look at uh, the work that he did. Uh, there were several cases in which he was able to establish an alibi for somebody that had previously been accused as being the perpetrator of the crime and was able to exonerate them. But not only that, but he was able to go in uh, for several violent crimes that we had, whether it be someone that lived nearby a crime scene that had digital forensics in their home or on the exterior of their home where they were potentially able to capture an image of a perpetrator or an act of violence that happened or even a commercial business in which they just didn't have the the, the technical know-how to be able to download that we were able to go in and, and Sergeant Barr was able to locate the images that were needed that were very important uh, for the furtherance of those cases so uh, it really really is important to us and we share technology here in LaPorte County as the chief indicated uh, and the last thing we want to do is we don't want to get into a position where we send a bill to another law enforcement agency, especially in the county, for a service that we provide. Because we know that if we do that, and, and believe me, that question has been asked on the county government level as well. We know that the next time that we ask another agency for their tech, technology, manpower expertise, we're probably going to get a bill from them. Mm -hmm. uh, we provide, for instance, an explosives dog for all of law enforcement in northwest Indiana, not just LaPorte County. Uh, we ask in return for the bomb squad from the Porter County Sheriff's Office, and I don't want a bill from them. So what we've done is we've actually embedded somebody, our canine handler that has an explosive dog, with their, their bomb uh, disposal unit. We call them a Lake County helicopter often, and that's between four and $12,000 an hour, and I don't want a bill for that either. Uh, but in turn, when Lake County calls us and they want uh, perhaps our scuba team or they want our fact team or they want our um, individual that downloads black boxes, event data recorders, and vehicles, we're pleased to provide that to them. We just, it's a give and take in law enforcement. We share resources because we want to make sure we're not redundant in the services that we provide. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions from council members? Yeah, we can ask. I have a, uh, I have a question for the chair. At this time. Are we asking questions now concerning the ordinance, or are we going to ask questions 
I thought this was just a presentation. It's a presentation, but if there's any comments or questions, the chief and the sheriff are willing to answer any questions. Whether it pertains to their pres presentation or the ordinance. We can talk about it at the ordinance also. All right, I, I have one question. Uh, um, you said that, or you made the uh, presentation that you always get a search warrant to look at uh, computer uh, electronic data. Is that mandatory? You address it. Either or. Is I that mandatory you, or does it, is that covered by the FCC rulings? I don't, I don't know of anything that's covered by the FCC rulings. However, I can tell you at the sheriff's office, if we don't get consent uh, from a victim, a suspect, or somebody in which we want to examine their electronic device, we always err on the side of caution and apply for a search warrant. If we don't get a search warrant, we don't have signed consent. We won't do it without signed consent. Uh, we simply just don't do it. And I can tell you that Matt Barr will not accept any digital device unless there's a search warrant or a consent to search signed by the owner of that uh, particular article. He, he won't even accept it. And that's, that's standard in, in law enforcement. It's the same is true of the labs at uh, Indiana State Police or at HIDO or the FBI. Okay. Mr. President? Yeah, Councilman Beatry? <clears throat> um, I had a question about, my question's been answered about the, the search warrant, but I guess for uh, my benefit, I just want to point a, point a clarification. <clears throat> Where does this request sit in the budget right now? Is it a part of the request now? Yeah, so it's in there. Yeah, it's, 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 in, it's in the budget. It's in the budget now. And <clears throat> the reason these two gentlemen are here this evening is because when it was presented to the uh, finance committee, uh, we had a lot of questions. We weren't familiar with this whole program. And in all fairness to the other council members, I asked Chief Swistek and uh, Sheriff Boyd, he came along to explain the whole program to the council members so they know exactly what. To totally agree with what you did. I, yeah, I agree 100%. percent And if it's a part of the proposal now, I'm okay with that too. Yes. And I have just one question. Okay. Let me finish. Let me finish my question and I'll go with you. Uh, how fast do we get results from, you know, a cell phone or a computer? Sure. Because it, it, we, we, I think it was said that speed is of the essence to get to get these devices looked at. And I'm just curious on how fast, how fast we can get it done versus sending it down to the Indiana State Police Lab and waiting a week or two weeks or whatever it takes. Yeah. So the first part of your question, how fast can we obtain the information um, almost within minutes, sometimes a little bit longer um, due to the complexity of what we are looking at. Um, if there's encryption with it, obviously it's going to take a little bit longer. We're going to have to work around some RAM and other things. But um, to your second part of the question, if we were to send it off to a laboratory, we have one of two choices currently. We either have the Hyda Laboratory over in Lake County, or we would have to go as far away as Fort Wayne to their laboratory. Um, some years ago, we were utilizing the Indiana State Police Lab in Fort Wayne, and then you're looking at <clears throat> taking a detective out of service, driving all the way to Fort Wayne, driving back, dropping off the device, waiting for the time to turn around. You're losing a lot of manpower as well. So having this in-house for all of us in LaPorte La County has been extremely beneficial. And it's also been recognized by the Indiana Criminal Justice Institute of the work that we've done up here that we hope that um, recognition continues when we turn in our grant application that is due November 1st of this year. So we have all intentions of hopefully completing that and getting that submitted. Okay, thank you. Councilman Dabby? Yeah, real quick. Um, this has been kind of passed down from the, the prosecutor to the county, and now it's ended up with, in, with the city here in terms of funding this. And my question is, why haven't they decided to continue along with this program? Why are they basically getting rid of this and giving it to the city rather than continuing to, to operate this program where it started? Well, we never operated the program. Okay. We never had anybody assigned to the unit. Uh, as you may recall, I said the Indiana Criminal Justice Institute said by the terms of the contract in Indiana Code, the equipment reverted to us. 
we opted to keep it with the Michigan City Police Department because they had somebody trained and certified in that. It's very time consuming and very, very expensive and we didn't want to replicate services because Michigan City has been a great partner, their police department, and willing to do these downloads, forensic examinations for us. Okay. Was, from my, from what I've heard, and it started with back with Espar. Yes. And then John Lake didn't he did not want to operate this anymore. How did, how did you know? Explain that to me, please. Right. He uh, did not support the idea of an ICAC unit. But I had a conversation with the prosecutor prior to the eighth of. April when I went before our county council and asked for that $26,650 and he said that he would support the unit in its concept, not financially, but support the unit as a digital forensics unit, not just as a unit that does investigations. And while I don't want to speak on behalf of prosecutor, like I think one of the issues that he had was the prosecutor's office actually uh, coordinating and initiating investigations. They should be more on the prosecutor's end rather than coordinating and initiating investigations. I think that was kind of one of his issues. And I, I also would like to add as part of that grant, and, and correct me, it's either two or three employee salaries were included as part of that grant funding as well, one of them being Sergeant Barr's salary. We were re reimbursed for that annually. Um, that is no longer the case. He's back um, being paid by the City of Michigan City. We no longer get that reimbursement, but we have all intentions when we apply for this grant to hopefully um, recoup some of that and add in some of those costs. But we're going to try. Councilman Fitzpatrick? Yeah, so uh, just a couple of questions. The equipment, you said, was valued at almost a quarter of a million dollars? Yes. And it's, uh, it's in the possession of Michigan City? That's correct. And the Indiana Criminal Justice Institute is aware of that. They have no issues with it. They say we can place it where we want within the county as long as we're using it for our, our investigations. Here so in it's still county. owned by the county, but yes, the city just has it at our facility. Yes. So who's responsible if anything is damaged or if the uh, equipment becomes obsolete <laughs> at some point? Well, at some point, I think we would need to get together in law enforcement, including other chiefs and marshals here in LaPorte County, and decide how we were going to do that and um, how it was going to be repaired or replaced. Okay. And uh, another question. With, with the program being in use for several years, what's the average conviction rate with uh, the assist of this program? I mean, without going back and looking at a case-by-case -case scenario, I, I can't answer that for you at this time. But I know there has been, as the sheriff alluded to earlier, there have been many people that um, this has helped them in uh, the prosecution of the case to show that they were, in fact, responsible for what they were accused of. So, I mean, there's many, many aspects to this, and it's been very beneficial to all of us. So, I have one more quick question. Have you ever, has the, uh, the county coroner's office ever used it to help with uh, assisting with time of death or anything like that with any of those cases or would it be open to them had they or if they're aware and approach you with it? Well I think they are aware because as you know they work hand in hand with us with death, death investigations. Um, yeah potentially absolutely it would be open to um, emergency services in the uh, furtherance of criminal investigations so absolutely I, I would see no reason why it wouldn't be turned down providing it is a criminal investigation and there's either consent or a search warrant that's been issued pursuant to the request of the downloads and the investigation itself. Uh, thank you, Sheriff. Thank you. I'd like to add one last thing also, and I had this discussion with the ATF supervisor um, last week, is that currently on um, both of our departments, we send our shell casings and any handguns we recover over to South Bend for forensic analysis, and currently we do not get charged for any of that. There is discussions ongoing currently that there may be charges forthcoming for departments that utilize their services over there. So it just shows again what the sheriff and I are trying to explain is that all of us in this region assist one another and currently we are very blessed that we aren't receiving bills from other agencies and therefore this $27,000 is for all of us to assist here on a local level while we're getting assistance from many other departments. Because I can only imagine with the shell casings and handguns that we submit, it would be enormous the bill I would get every year. Okay, Councilman Stumley. Um, thank you, sir. Some of my questions got cleared up, but uh, I wanted to ask uh, Sheriff Boyd. Uh, if I understand this right, I remember when uh, John Esper started this program, then uh, it was under a grant process, correct? Um, the grant's running out now? 
No, the grant ceased the moment the uh, new prosecutor said that he no longer supported the ICAC unit and was essentially shutting it down. That, that grant funding ceased at that moment. For instance, the salaries that have been written in that grant stopped at that moment. Okay, and then, um, well, then you you went in front of the uh, county council for funding? Correct. And they denied the funding? No, they, they approved it in a 7-0 vote, the $26,650 for the licensing and software agreements to get us through until they expire in 2020. Okay. Um, like you said, that, that was... So 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 they 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 um they funded this to 2020 the Ford County Council yes and it was is is out of the prosecutor's budget it's not in your budget in the sheriff's department you didn't put it in there no we did not okay. um, we we had hoped that as Chief Swissex said uh, grant funding just opened up the window for accepting applications for that we're pursuing grants but that would be not until next July before we know whether or not we're a recipient of grant funding for the year 2021. We couldn't apply for it this year because uh, the um, grant ceased this year. So we weren't eligible to uh, go back in. I even asked the Criminal Justice Institute, can we come, on, come in and just take over the project? And they said, no, it's not a transferable grant. Once the initial author and applicant for that grant ceased the grant, then it's terminated immediately. You can't transfer um, coordination to another unit of government. And uh, one of the other things I was kind of confused about too is, um, I know it comes to the Michigan City Police, and the, the officer does the does the program. It, um, does some, somebody from the sheriff's department also do it, or did it always go to the Michigan City? It just seems like if the county has the had the grant, it would be a, a sheriff's officer that would be in charge of the. It, you know, it, it could be. Uh, however, we would have to send somebody to all the trained and the certifications. Very, very long and very expensive. And in the interest of not having redundant services, that's why we've opted not to do that at this point. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions by council members? Councilman Fitzpatrick? Uh, right now you said uh, Sheriff Barr is the one certified to run this program. Detective, uh, Sergeant, I'm sorry. Detective Sergeant Matthew Barr. Yeah. So if he uh, leaves the force or is unable to continue his service with MCPD, who will be taking it over at that point? We would have to have somebody trained in that expertise. And probably you're looking at anywhere from four to 12 months of training. Throughout the years, the training he's received is probably equivalent to almost a year's of training. He's constantly gone 10 weeks at a time, four weeks at a time, sometimes getting training in that in subsequent years um, to get certified to the point that he is certified today. So with... If this funding is approved and uh, Sergeant Barr is no longer able to run a, the program, then does, it would just be in limbo at that point? Not necessarily. Um, some of the licensing agreements that I spoke on tonight, one of them being Cellbrite, we have two other technicians trained on that software, and they're also trained on a few other license agreements. I don't know which ones, um, but I can tell you we do, aside from Sergeant Barr, we do have Detective Corporal Francisco Rodriguez and Detective Corporal Kyle Shaparsky that are trained with Cellbrite and a few of the other um, agreements, and they have worked side-by-side -side with Sergeant Barr. Um, they're maybe not at his level, but they have worked with him. So there is some cross-training that has been taking place in recent years. And just uh, one last question. Now, provided that uh, you are successful in receiving grants, if the grants aren't successful, What's the, uh, are we going to be like a back and forth with the county? Maybe one year they'll take it up, or are we going to be on the hook for the entirety of this program? My recommendation would be that we sit down with LaPorte County Prosecutor um, John Lake, all of the major um, law enforcement chiefs um, throughout the county, and that we brainstorm on how we can continue these services. And if it's something where we split up the funding or seek other alternative funding measures, um, I think, you know, between all of us meeting, we'll come up with an alternative. All right, thank you. Councilman Prisbolinski. Um I, I don't know if the other council members have this uh, report with them. I brought mine. Uh, I take exception to uh, the paragraph that's in here. Uh, on I marked the page as page four, uh, made by Detective Sergeant uh, Barr about our current prosecutor. I think that that uh, should have been left for them to sort through. I think you know what I'm talking about. All right, the accusations of 
um, some kind of criminal accusations going on in the program. What that is, I don't know, and Mr. Lake's not here to answer that. But I take exception to that. And also, um, I think that uh, some of the council members feel that they were blindsided by this and why there wasn't a service agreement or some kind of agreement brought to the council beforehand in the form of a resolution. And the way I take this is that, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, Detective Sergeant Barr has been working this program since the county took it over. Am I right or wrong? He's your he's your guy who implements the program. So we've actually been doing this unknowingly with you designating an officer to this program of whatever his salary is and his benefits and his car. So you already adopted this program without coming to the city council. See, that's what I think some of the members, um, I'll speak for myself. I take exception to it. And I was at those budget hearings, and I think that the council should have been informed. And this is our oversight reach. We have every right to ask questions, whatever we want. And there were also, and I'm going to make this statement tonight, there are also some emails put out there that I take exception to. I think that as chief, you need to control your staff on what, on their willy-nilly approach on putting emails out, willy-nilly making statements about council members who ask pertinent questions for pertinent information. So I think that what Mr. Fitzpatrick said is that you need to work on some kind of agreement and come to the council for through a resolution to fund this program to know where we're going. And and you may take exception to those remarks, but I think that speaking for myself, I have that right. I'm one vote and I have that right to make that statement that we are the oversight and that as law enforcement Yes, we should okay a program or, or look at it what, it, what its cost is to the general public. That's what I think that is, has a bad taste in some of the members. You know, and I know that you had a vote for 7 to 0, but that still doesn't... I think that a lot of people, some of the members were blindsided by this uh, approach and what was going on and uh, the other rumors that were out there on people being arrested and you know their computers being confiscated and that you could download them without their okay so I, I think that I think that some of those questions are resolved but then I go back to thinking about the raid that we had at local option and people were asked to give up their phones and a lot of people refused on what was going on there. Now, we can't deny that that happened. Okay. I don't right. think anybody was asked for their phones and, and I'm prepared to respond whenever you like me. Yeah, go so. ahead, right. Chief. Councilman, uh, can I finish my statement? I want to know, can that uh, forensic uh, device be used to enhance home video security uh, cameras that have infrared. Say if there's a crime in a neighborhood, say a car stolen and somebody has a camera on their house, if you, if you make it there within a timely period, I think 72 hours before they're wiped, that you could enhance that to know what was going on in that neighborhood. I, I, I can't speak on infrared, but I can tell you that there was a case in which Matt Barr helped us with. It was a hit and run. It uh, made uh, regional news where a young man was um, seriously injured. He was running down uh, one of our county roads and he was hit by somebody in a hit and run. We canvassed the neighborhood and a gentleman said, wait a minute, I've got security cameras um, facing the roadway, one in my mailbox, and you're welcome to look at it. He didn't know how to download it. He didn't have the expertise. He had never done it before. 
Right. So we got it to uh, detect Barr, and he actually was able to uh, see the hit-and-run vehicle, and he was able to actually make out the license plate uh, through his enhancement. And it led us to the vehicle that was being hidden, and we subsequently uh, found the perpetrator, and that individual was arrested as a result of that. Okay. Thank you, Sheriff. That answers my question. Any other questions or comments from council members? Any other questions or uh, comments from council members? Uh, I want to thank you, Chief, and thank you, Sheriff, for coming this evening. Uh, hang around so we can get through the... Uh, I know... Sorry, sir. There's no public comment during this time of the meeting. Uh, I would like to make a point with the information that you provided the City Council with the cases that Officer Barr worked on the the document yeah yes sir. yeah yeah I, I went through it and I looked at all the cases and with my you know uh, police knowledge crime knowledge anyway I thought where he was involved that those were cases that possibly were solved and I went through that report and I counted up 69 so I think that's great work for that for that unit to be able to solve 69 crimes into some of the situations that were described in the uh, in the uh, pamphlet. So anyway, thank you. And yes, go ahead. If I may, Mr. President, in the valuable time of the sheriffs, if he could be excused, that I could just stay for the remainder sure. of the. I mean, this is obviously my request. Yes, sure. And I again appreciate the sheriff's time, and I know he has a busy day ahead of him tomorrow, and I'd just like to see if he could be excused. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Sheriff, for coming. Yep. So we are now done with the uh, reports of other city officers and departments. Uh, we are down to the uh, claims docket. And is there a, uh, the claims docket falls under fund 2042 of Riverboat claims. And that's for 102, uh, $102 $608.87. And under fund 2031 Boyd Development, $15,792.65. Uh, is there a motion? Motion to pay, to pay the claims. claims. Support. Uh, who made the original motion? Okay. Councilman Beatry made the motion, and Councilman Dabney seconded to pay the claims. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Claims are paid. Ms. Nyla, are there any petitions before us this evening? There are no petitions. Communications this evening? Correspondence was received in the clerk's office on September 30th and October 7th from DLZ Weekly Activity Reports ESG Energy Project. Correspondence was also received October 4th from John Kirk's Field Observation Report on ESG Solar System Installation Testing of Patriot Park and Senior Center. Um, also was received on October 9th from John Kirk, another field observation report for the solar system inspection at the Senior Center. Correspondence was also received on October 7th, 2019 from Councilman Fitzpatrick regarding missing equipment from Central Services. And Ms. Nyla, Councilman Fitzpatrick requ requested that his correspondence be read into the minutes, which I will do at this time. Uh, his correspondence is dated October 7th, 2019, Michigan City Common Council. In recent weeks, I have been contacted multiple times by several city employees in regards to missing equipment from Central Services. As you all know, I contacted the superintendent with these concerns as I copied you in the mayor's office in addition to the Michigan City Police Department. Since that time, I have been contacted again by concerned employees, some who want to remain anonymous and others who are willing to come forward. I have attached a copy of the most recent inventory audit for your review. This is a comprehensive list compiled of serial numbers and internal control numbers. Of the nearly 200 pieces of equipment, list, items listed, about 40, 40 are unaccounted for. As a, as a council, you are charged with being the fiscal body of the city 
If these items that are essential to the city employees' daily jobs duties are missing from the city's inventory, who's responsible for replacing these items that are valued in the thousands of dollars? Signed, sincerely, Sean Fitzpatrick, 4th Ward City Councilman. Mr. President. Yes, Councilwoman. I would respectfully request that you read the correspondence received in the clerk's office on October 9th from Robert Zahner, Superintendent of Central Services, responding to Councilman Fitzpatrick's letter of October 7th. I have it. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, letter dated October 8, 2019. Uh, response to Councilman Fitzpatrick letter dated October 7, 2019. Dear Common Council, earlier this week I received a copy of Councilman Fitzpatrick's letter to you regarding missing equipment at Michigan City Central Services which including, included a handwritten inventory list. First, please note that the handwritten inventory list was an old list from 2012. This was a list started by Dave Farmer and utilized as his own personal notes. I do not know how Councilman Fitzpatrick obtained these notes and why Councilman Fitzpatrick asserts that these notes reflect that there are 40 items of equipment which are uncommon. This is not accurate as there are many items on this list that have been disposed of years ago. Second, toward the end of September 2019, it was discovered that certain equipment was missing from Michigan City Central Services. I am in the process of doing my investigation into the missing equipment. In addition, I turn this matter over to the Michigan City Police Department immediately upon receipt of said information. It is my understanding that a detective has been assigned to further investigate and that the investigations are still open and pending. Due to the pending investigations and a possibility that this could become an employee personnel matter at this time, I am limited to the nature and extent of what, if any, information I can release. Moving forward, I would appreciate Councilman Fitzpatrick or any other members of the Michigan City Council who may receive information relevant to this issue, to please discuss the same with me and or the detective assigned to investigate. Uh, and, and assigned respectfully, Robert Zotter, Superintendent of Michigan City Central Services, <laughs> slash maintenance. Okay, Ms. Tyler, are there any resolutions before us this evening? There are no resolutions. And our first ordinance this evening on second reading by title only without objection. Asylum. An ordinance on second reading by title only requiring the city controller to provide the common council documentation regarding the damage to city property and payment of liability claims in creating section 2-324 in the Michigan City Municipal Code. And this is introduced by Mr. Presbolinski, Mr. Stemley, Mr. Fitzpatrick, and Mr. Hamilton. And Councilman Prince Yes, I would like to ask the authors to uh, put me on also as a co-author, please. Ms. Nyla, if you would put Mr. Prince Mr. Paul Prince on as a co-author. I will do that. All right. You're welcome. Uh, what, what, are there any comments from the authors? Any comments from the authors? No. Okay, this evening I'm going to uh, make amendments to this ordinance. And all the council members have a copy in front of them. And I can go ahead and, and read the, uh, the ordinance and mention where the uh, amendments are at. Whereas the Common Council finds that in fulfilling its responsibility to citizens of Michigan City to monitor the city's finances and condition of its, of its properties, it is advisable for the Common Council to receive documentation 
from the city controller describing any damage to any city-owned real or personal property. In the case of such damage for which the city, including any of its departments or agencies, either directly or through insurance, pays $1,500 or more to repair the damage. And what, what the amendment is being made, the amount was at $2,500 and is now being reduced to $1,500. The second one, uh, whereas the Common Council finds that it is in fulfilling its responsibility to the citizens of Michigan City to monitor the city's finances, is it, is, it is advisable for the Common Council to receive documentation from the city controller describing any liability claim against the city or theft of any city property or cash, including any of its departments or agencies for any tort, breach of contract, or the violation of civil rights for which the city, including any of its departments or agencies, pays directly or through insurance $5,000 or more to resolve the claim by either mutual agreement or judgment or any theft of city non-cash property with a value of $100 or of $50 or more of cash. So the value has come down from $500 and it's being amended to $100. Uh, going down to property damage, the city controller shall provide the common council either directly or by sitting, submitting it to the city clerk for distribution to the council with a copy of any and all documentation, hard copy and digital in the controller's possession or control regarding any damage to real or personal property owned by the city, including any of its departments or agencies for which the city, including any of its departments or agencies, pays either directly or through insurance $1,500 or more for repair and it was originally $2,500, and that is being amended down to $1,500. And liability claims, number four, the controller shall provide the common council either directly or by submitting it to the city clerk for distribution to the council with a copy of any and all documentation, hard copy and digital, and the controller's possession or control regarding any claim or liability against the city or any of its departments or agencies for any tort, breach of contract, or violation of city rights for which the city, including any of its departments or agencies, pays either directly or through insurance, and $5,000 was the total, and that is being amended to reduce to $2,500 or more to resolve the claim by either mutual agreement or judgment. And finally, under theft, the city controller shall provide the common council either directly or by submitting it to the city clerk for distribution to the council with a copy of any and all documentation, hard copy and digital in the controller's office, possession of controlling regarding any theft of city non-cash property with the value of currently $500 and that's being amended down to $100 or of $50 or more of Cash. I so move. Is there you second the motion? Yes. Okay. There has been a uh, motion to amend by Councilman Don Prisbolinski, a second uh, to the motion by Councilman Paul Prisbolinski. Uh, I've already. Uh, are there any sponsor and any comments by the uh, sponsors? Okay, no. Councilman Prusbolinski. Uh, I first of all, I want <clears throat> to commend uh, Councilman Fitzpatrick on his work on uh, uh, the inventory list, and I think that there has to be. Uh, we've gone a long time without any uh, inventories uh, going on in departments. I I know that there's a lot, a lot of uh, equipment out there and I think that it's a good uh, thing that we move forward on this because we'll find out 
what's going on in the, in the departments. I mean, I, I think as for oversight, we need, we need to do this. Thank you. Okay, is, is there any public comment? Any public comment on these amendments? Any public comment on these amendments? Public comment is now closed. Council comment? Councilman Fitzpatrick? Oh, can we take a short break after this passes or fails? Sure we can. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, with that being said, are there any other further council comments? Councilman Dabney? Okay. All right. Uh, I have a, a couple yeah. comments, and I made the amendments and lowered the amounts because by sitting on the uh, finance committee and the departments that come to us asking for monies every year for tools, whether it be lawnmowers, whether it be saws, whatever the piece of equipment is, it seems we go through this cycle. Uh, if things are missing, we're going to find out they're missing. Uh, we're going to start getting reports. And it's all about accountability. It's about transparency and saying, yeah, we have it. No, we don't have it. Uh, that has to stop. Uh, if the administration doesn't want to do it and hold people accountable, then the city council is going to step in and, and do this. I mean, we've been thinking about it for a while, and we finally came up and said, let's do it. Uh, so with that being, and then the other thing that happens is during budget hearings is different departments want vehicles, they want trucks. Uh, we're talking $60,000 for equipment for, for a pickup truck, and we go out and look at it, and I'm not going to say they're destroyed, but they're in bad shape. And you wonder, how did this truck ever get in this condition, being banged up and what have you, without anybody having any idea about it? I mean, I, I don't know. The council never finds out until the end. Uh, take, for example, uh, and no reflection on the, on the police department, but, you know, the police uh, vehicles get in accidents and... <laughs> By chance, if we find out about it, it's just, you know, hearsay or somebody shows you a picture. The bottom line is the city council wants to know. The city council has to know. We appropriate the funding for these vehicles and for the city budget. And as a city councilman, I want to know personally. I take this personal on spending this money. So that's why... Uh, I was a sponsor, and that's why uh, I'm sponsoring these amendments. So we can, I'm asking the council, do we want to vote on each amendment individually, or do we want to vote on all the amendments at what, on one time? Okay. 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 Is everybody in agreement that we vote on at one time? All right. Okay, with that being said, Miss, all those in favor of no. passing, yeah, it's got to it's gotta go through the clerk. Yeah. Miss Nylab, on the vote. Mr. Stemley? Aye. Mr. Beatry? Aye. Mr. Dabney? Aye. Mr. Miss Carnes? Aye. Mr. Fitzpatrick? Aye. Mr. Hamilton? Aye. Mr. Don Presbolinski? Aye. Mr. Paul Presbolinski? Aye. And Mr. Simmons? Aye. We have nine in favor and no one opposed. Okay, and we are going to take a five-minute recess, and we will resume at 25 after 8. And cut the mics, please. Call the uh, meeting back to order. Ms. Stilob, our next ordinance on second reading by title only without objection, please. Don't you have to ask for comments um, on the amended ordinance? Yeah, that's for the uh, treasurer for the Commission for Women. Never mind. I know that. I thought he had to ask for it. 
the ordinance if there was any. Never mind. Okay, um, an ordinance on second reading by title only, amending section 2-459B6 of Michigan City Municipal Code to provide for a treasure for the Commission of Women, and this is introduced by Mr. Fitzpatrick. Thank you, Ms. Nyland, and does the author have anything he'd like to add at this time? Not at this time. Okay, is there anyone from the public who wishes to speak on this ordinance? Anyone from the public who wishes to speak on this ordinance? Anyone from the public who wishes to speak on this ordinance? Public comments now closed. Any council comments? Any council comments? Any council comments? This ordinance will be held over to our next meeting. Uh, Ms. Nyla, our first ordinance on third reading by title only without objection. An ordinance on third reading by title only, repealing and replacing Article 8 and Chapter 46 in the Michigan City Municipal Code, commonly known as the floodplain. And this is introduced by Ms. Carnes. And does the author have anything she'd like to add at this time? Uh, yes, this is uh, simply bringing our ordinance in compliance with federal and state regulations. Thank you. Is there anyone from the public that wishes to speak on this ordinance? Anyone from the public wishes to speak on this ordinance? Anyone from the public wishes to speak on this ordinance? Public comment is now closed. Any council comments? Move for adoption. There's been a motion by Councilwoman Carnes and seconded by Councilman Beatry. Is there any further council comment? Any further council comment? Ms. Nyleb, on the vote, please. Mr. Beatry? Aye. Mr. Dabney? Aye. Ms. Carnes? Aye. Mr. Fitzpatrick? Aye. Mr. Hamilton? Aye. Mr. Don Prezebolinski? Aye. Mr. Paul Prezebolinski? Aye. Mr. Simmons? Aye. And Mr. Stemley? Aye. We have nine in favor and no one opposed. Okay, thank you, Ms. Nyleb. Our second ordinance on third reading, by title only, without objection, Ms. Nyleb. An ordinance on third reading by title only, creating section 22-54 in chapter 22 of the Michigan City Municipal Code to be known as the Building Permit Conflict of Interest. And this is introduced by Mr. Dabney. Yeah, does the author have anything he'd like to add at this time? Nothing more to add. Okay, thank you, Councilman. Anyone from the public wish to speak on this ordinance? Anyone from the public wish to speak on this ordinance? Anyone from the public wish to speak on this ordinance? Public comment is now closed. Any council comment? Council comment? Motion to approve. Well, uh, Councilman Simmons uh, made the motion and it was seconded by Councilman Dabney. Ms. Patrick. Any further uh, council comment? Ms. Nyleb on the vote. Mr. Dabney? Aye. Ms. Carnes? Aye. Mr. Fitzpatrick? Aye. Mr. Hamilton. Aye. Mr. Don Presbolinski. Aye. Mr. Paul Presbolinski. Aye. Mr. Simmons. Aye. Mr. Stemley. Aye. And Mr. Beatry. Aye. We have nine in favor and no one opposed. And thank you, Ms. Nyla. And our next ordinance on third reading by title only without objection. An ordinance on third reading by title only. An ordinance or resolution for appropriation of tax rates, and this is introduced by Mr. Dabney. And Mr. Dabney, do you have anything you'd like to say? No, nope, uh, after it was given to us, after we made the uh, recommended cuts in the from the uh, finance committee meetings, I uh, wanted to just make sure that the numbers checked out, everything was good there, so I have no more comment. Okay, thank you, Councilman. And there was a formal public hearing that was held on this ordinance on October the 1st. Is there anyone from the public that wishes to speak on this ordinance? Anyone from the public wishes to speak on this ordinance? Anyone from the public wishes to speak on this ordinance? Any council comments? Any council comments? Oh, Councilwoman Carnes? Um, there was a quarter million dollars uh, cut out of this budget, out of the streets, pavings, and sidewalks off fund, um, ostensibly to uh, replace playground equipment in Washington Park. Yet, according to uh, Mr. Dabney, Dabney, who's the liaison to the Park Department, the Park Department has a plan uh, to replace playground equipment in 2021. 
I don't understand why the city council is trying to micromanage the park. They have a plan. Uh, they prioritize their projects, and they're the experts, and I think we need to let them work their plan. Uh, furthermore, the city council can't transfer this money uh, into the park's budget. That's not how the budget process works. It's simply going to be returned to the riverboat fund. Um, Mr. Przbolinski asserted that our streets don't look that bad compared to other cities. Well, I, I got a call uh, about a week and a half ago from a woman that was uh, uh, concerned about the sidewalk in front of her house. She lives on Cleveland and concerned about the uh, school kids that have to walk up and down that sidewalk. And, you know, I told her that I would, you know, request that, you know, we address that. But I had to tell her that some of the people on the city council, um, this is not a priority. Streets and sidewalks, it was stated, are not going to be a priority. Um, with or without this money being restored, certain neighborhoods are, are going to be taken care of because the redevelopment is going to fund uh, projects in uh, the TIF districts. So, um, but this $250,000 is a quality of life issue for the rest of our neighborhoods. So I hope you'll support the restoration um, of the uh, $250,000 to the budget. And I'd like to make an amendment to the 2020 budget ordinance restoring $250,000 to fund 443.030 capital outlay streets, paving, and sidewalks. Uh, that would increase fund 0005 casino riverboat adopted budget to $9,543.00. Nine million five hundred forty-three, one hundred five on budget form number four. There's been a uh, motion. Can I comment, please? We have to get a second. There's been a motion. Is there a second? I second it. Wait, Councilman Fitzpatrick had his uh, light on. I had a comment. I wasn't looking to support that. Okay. Councilman Przbolinski seconded it. Yep. Okay. There's been a motion and a second <clears throat> to amend the 2020 budget ordinance restoring 25000 to fund 243. 250000 250000 Okay. And Dawn, you have that in front of you, don't you? Yeah. Okay. So I won't. Yeah, I won't, I'm not going to repeat all the other verbiage. Just as long as Dawn has it for the uh, for the records. <coughs> okay. Uh, comment, council comments. Any amendment? Yeah. Right Councilman here. Fitzpatrick. Yeah, it's very fitting of a lame duck council person to take away a bargaining chip to get playground equipment repaired at our Washington Park, which is a tourist destination and our crown jewel. You don't know where that $250,000 is going. They can put that up there wherever. And it, it's still many, many neighborhoods that have sidewalks that aren't complete. And there's no way we can have any say in where it goes unless we do measures like this. What people fail to realize, the mayor is only the administrator. They can only appropriate and do what we allow them to do. The city council is the power. We control the budgets. We write the laws. Lame ducks like you and this bobblehead mentality is the, reason, the reason why the city is in the condition it is right now. Councilman, I Councilman Fitzpatrick, do not use demeaning language towards another council member. I retract the word lame duck and say leaving council person. Councilwoman, uh, oh, Councilman yeah. Dab Dabney, yeah. what's I was, next? Uh, yeah. Um, I was sitting here looking at this and, and I thought I was pretty meticulous in my notes and, and what we actually cut from the budget. Engineering riverboat. Um, nowhere does it talk about the park um, that we're cutting for parks and, and and I talked about the plan for the park to be doing this in 2021. Um, so next year is 2020. We did a 2020 budget. So the $250,000, as I look at the sheet that you handed out, uh, Riverboat Gaming Fund, this is the engineer, paving and sidewalk. And I'm trying to see how you mixed in the park department uh, with that. Um, so
So the people that were at the finance committee meeting, the three finance committee members, uh, we sat and talked about this, and this is the recommend recommendation that we made. Um, Councilman uh, Fitzpatrick did talk about, you know, with us making that cut, you, people would have to come back to the financial arm of the city in order to do that additional appropriation. Um, so this is our thought process. Uh, maybe there is a new thought process in terms of how we're going to do things. Maybe we feel like we need to take a little bit more control uh, of some of the funds. And you know, I agree, and we all agree, because that passed 3-0 uh, uh, in regards to our recommendations to make that cut. So, you know, when this vote comes up, because it is going to come up for a vote, I am going to stick with that cut, just like we uh, made it in the Finance Committee budget hearings. Councilman Beatry? I have tremendous respect for Councilwoman Carnes, and I, and I agree with her on almost every issue that comes before the council, um, not because I respect her, but because she's usually right. Uh, on this issue, though, um, I served on the Finance Committee four times, I think, and uh, I have tremendous respect for the Finance Committee, and I was not there at these hearings uh, when the Finance Committee was. And the reason why I'm not going to support her amendment is because uh, of what Councilman Dabney said. I disagree with almost everything that Councilman Fitzpatrick said. But I do agree with Councilman Dabney that the finance committee needs to be heeded by the rest of the council members who don't go to those meetings. So I'm going to stick with their recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman Przybylinski. Thank you. Um, I, uh, was, I was also at... Uh, the budget hearings and uh, I did not vote on anything because that's the way the committee operates and sometimes I have a question with that that you should make recommendations and not vote until you get to the council meeting but that's my own opinion because then if somebody brings something to your attention you're not biased already but and I'm not trying to impeach anybody's uh, particular stance on anything. But what I will say is the reason I do support this, when I was, after I was sworn in, I proceeded to investigate paving projects in the second ward. I asked the city engineer for a list of paving projects. Well, they were scrambling. They couldn't come up with a list. It, it took about two weeks to come up with a list. And then when I asked for the list, I was told I wasn't getting the list. That the mayor told the city engineer not to give me the list. So I eventually got the list because it was put on file in the clerk's office. And I will tell you, there's been absolutely hardly nil done in the second ward over the last 12 years. Hardly nil. That's why I support this. Because you have to look at what is... Councilman Fitzpatrick? What's the point? Did, Wait a second. I wasn't sure. I, I think maybe Councilman President Westbrook was confused. You agreed to give them the money back. Right. You second that. Right. That's exactly right. To do some more paving. All right. All right. To Go do ahead, some more paving and some more sidewalks. Because of not being anything done in the second ward. I never voted on this to amend it. I didn't bias my position. I researched my position. And my position is this. Oh, they're paving a main intersector in the, in the second ward right now. They paved Barker Ave. That's not doing anything in my neighborhood because that's what they call a main intersector. It goes all the way through town. They didn't do anything in the neighborhoods. They haven't even painted the no parking zones in the last 12 years. Give me a break. Thank you. I'm, I'm supporting putting this back in here for that reason. And if anything, you should look at this list. Because you have to stand up for the area you represent. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Councilwoman Carnes. 
a reference to the comments about the park department that was brought up at the last council meeting so um, I know I'm not uh, I know that it can't be restored to the park department for uh, um, use for you know repairing playgrounds and like I said uh, there is a plan the park department has a plan and I think we should respect their schedule uh, I am still the council person for the fifth ward and I will continue to be the council person uh, until the new council takes effect and I will continue to advocate for the fifth ward and all the city and all the city wards until that time I have a uh, comment and speaking about the uh, streets in Michigan City, there are streets that do need repair, and there are streets that are in very good condition. And I've, I'll stand by that. Uh, there have been areas, the whole Eastport area, the city spent a half million dollars there this past summer, black topping and sidewalks. The uh, Sheridan Beach area has gotten hundreds of thousands of dollars of new sidewalks and black topping. The Village Green area has gotten brand new sidewalks and black topping in the last couple years. So there are areas in town that black topping and street infrastructure work has been done and I've supported all of them. And is there more work to be done? There certainly is. In the second ward, which has been neglected, which I agree with uh, Councilman Przybulski, uh, you take, for example, and we spoke about it, I think we spoke about it at the last meeting, is uh, York Street, right there by uh, Marsh School. I mean, to me, that's a washboard. And I know it's gonna cost a lot of money to repair that street, but we need to start looking in that direction instead of just bypassing it and putting down, and we have spent, there's $3 billion, I believe, that was appropriated for blacktop this year, and uh, there's a lot of blacktopping going on. So I think that program is going in the right direction, and I'm sure with some new leadership in different areas that more work's going to be done. But I want to focus back to the park playground equipment in Washington Park. And my colleagues on the finance committee all agreed, and I would say probably 99% of the folks that were in those budget hearings agreed with our statements that that playground equipment needs to be replaced. and needs to be replaced now. We get $12 million a year from the riverboat. Okay, and there's money in that budget to do that work. But just to make sure that it gets done, that's why we pulled the money out of the streets and sidewalks. And I understand there's a lot of sidewalk work that get, needs to get done. I've waited for three years to get sidewalks done in certain areas of town. So I know there's a waiting list and there's a, and there's a list to get work done. But I'm going to put it to you like this, and I'm going to put it to the uh, citizens of Michigan City that are watching this meeting. What's more important, blacktop and concrete, or a child safety is they're playing on antiquated, not ADA accessible, playground equipment in our main park in Michigan City where thousands and thousands of people come every year to enjoy that lakefront. But if you're a handicapped child, you can't enjoy playground equipment there. You can't even come down there because there's nothing to do for you. So with that respect, that's my train of thought. I've spoken to the mayor. I've spoken to the city planner. In fact, he was here when he was giving us a state of the city address on the improvements in the city, and we I discussed at that time, playground equipment in Washington Park. He says, I'll look into it. Well, I don't know how far he looked into it, because I actually went to the last redevelopment commission meeting, 
and express my viewpoint on the playground equipment. Some Redevelopment Commission members had heard about it, others hadn't. But they all agreed, they all agreed that it needs to be done, trying to get them to pay for it through the TIF area. But one thing I did learn is that the Redevelopment Commission cannot pay for regular playground equipment in a TIF district, but they can pay for what's considered a destination playground. I don't know exactly what that means, but it's a destination playground that they can pay for. And they did promise me that after the first of the year, when they get their budget and their funding uh, resources, that they would sit down and take another look at it. So in that respect, maybe the Redevelopment Commission can help. In giving the priorities to the Park Department and letting them work their plan, I can understand that train of thought. But if the city council knows, if we know that something is not right, we have to provide the leadership to make sure it gets done and it gets done in a hurry and it gets done properly. And that's why I'm taking the stand that we need to get this playground equipment up to date, fixed, and be done with it so that children can come down to Washington Park and play on safe, up-to-date playground equipment. Thank you. Councilman Przybylinski. Well, Mr. President, that's one way to put it, but it's also another way is that for somebody to have their sidewalk uh, crossing guard actually guarded is important. To actually have their corner handicap accessible is important. But I will say this, is that the, the way you say that is I feel that you're impeaching my stand on this particular item. I take exception to those remarks because safety out on the streets is just as important as that. But let me ask you this. Has the council had a workshop with the mayor to come up with a project list? Has the leadership of the council asked for a workshop to get some of this stuff done? To go over the project list for the roads? That's where we need to go because just because you stripped that money, have you got a promise from the mayor that that's going to get done? That, that, <laughs> I, I, that's like if I'm going to look into something, that's like, okay, your, your tire's half flat, maybe I'll get you some air. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Councilman. Thank you. <coughs> Any other council comments? Councilman Simmons. I'm very grateful for the $2 million of paving of streets and, and sidewalks out in the tall timber area, but... You know, I also respect, respectfully uh, respect uh, the Finance Committee uh, decision. Any further council comments? All right. Having none, is there anyone from the public that wishes to speak on this ordinance or amendment? Kathy Stransky, 223 Sparker Ave. I just want to bring to everybody's attention that less than a year ago, they came down Barker Ave and they put in ADA ramps and sidewalks on the corners in our neighborhood. They came right back this fall and redid them all again. Now, if they did them a year ago, surely that money could have went to another area of town for the um, other other sidewalks. When I questioned it, they told me that they were off a little bit of a measurement and they decided to redo them. I think that was a waste of money and it's just one problem after another with the, with the um, ADA sidewalks. Go look where they're redoing them all. Thank you. Rodney McCormick, 617 Union Street. I was going to say the same thing even down on Cool Spring and Franklin Street. These sidewalks, these handicap accessibles was just put in a year ago 
and they tore out already. Do any one of y'all know? Who's paying for this? Who's paying for it? Gene, you should say more for the Sixth Ward. Lakeland has been the most neglected ward in this city. I was born there. It still looks the same. King Drive haven't seen nothing but patches. Seems like that goes on in all our black neighborhoods. I'm kind of tired of it. Tired of seeing this going down this way. And when it comes to tall timbers, in most of these neighborhoods, if it wasn't for me picking up my phone and walking to these neighborhoods and pointing out these things, tall timbers were one of the biggest ones. Flooding. They still have issues. I stood up for them. I'm not from the Sixth Ward no more. I don't represent. I'm not running for nothing. There's no way I should be having to go around here and show the, the problems that's in this community. We got to do better, Gene. Oh, by the yeah. way, there is no handicap parks nowhere in Michigan State. Accessible. Is there, is there any other public comment? Any other public comment on this amendment? Public comment is now closed. Any further council comments on the amendment? Any further council comments on the amendment? Any further council comments? Ms. Nyla, on the vote? Ms. Carnes? Aye. Mr. Fitzpatrick? Nay. Mr. Hamilton? Nay. Mr. Pre Don Preswalinski? Nay. Mr. Paul Preswalinski? Aye. Mr. Simmons? Nay. Mr. Stemley? Nay. Mr. Beatry? Nay. And Mr. Dabney? Nay. We have two in favor and seven opposed. Thank you, Ms. Nyla. And, uh, and now we can also, uh, since this is dealing with the budget, uh, we also have to talk about the uh, IAC program. And so I guess uh, at, at, at the budget hearings, that was, we had, we didn't take a vote on it because, yeah, we tabled it because we wanted the council to have knowledge on it and have their hearsay on it. So tonight we'll be voting, we have to vote to bring it back up and put it back on the, uh, on the point, budget. Point of order. Okay. You don't have to. Bring it back up. It's already there. Yeah, that's my understanding. If you want to remove it? You have to. Somebody needs to make a motion. Okay. To remove. Okay. Okay. Is. I mean, does anybody want to make a motion on the IAC yeah. program? I make them make that motion. Go ahead. Councilman I make the motion, and I'm trying, trying to remember what uh, was that under cap. That wasn't in the capital projects, was it, or contra contractual, contractual service? I make the motion to eliminate the twenty-seven thousand. Is that the total that we got? Twenty-seven two hundred. Twenty-seven twenty, I think. I think that's the number I wrote down. Hold on. I'm sorry if I don't have it. It's got to be in writing. No, because they eliminated. Point of order. Eliminated two this needs to be in writing. And here it is. Yeah, the total, the total for the IAC program would be twenty-seven thousand two hundred dollars. Chief, can you come to the microphone, please? So the total amount for the IAC program, I had 27200 because you eliminated two contracts. <coughs> That's sure correct. We have the right total. That's correct. We removed 650 from one, 640 from another for a total of $1,290. Subtracting that from 28490 leaves us with 27200 Right. Um, okay, thank you. Twenty-seven thousand two hundred. Um, Mr. President, I'd like to ask one question to uh, when it was explained to me with the with the grant paying for this. Uh, part of the salary was Sergeant Bars. Would that come in effect too with the budget for next year? No, he's 
Yeah, he's already in our 2020 operating budget. The um, contractual services for this 27,000 is to support the digital forensics unit for the licensing and software. And I cannot emphasize enough how important this is until we get another grant. This will slow down any major investigation this police department does. We will not be solving major crimes. It'll take some time for us to get this information back, delaying and leaving suspects in the community for months. I can only caution you that this is very important to all of us in LaPorte County, particularly Michigan City's Police Department. Um, like you said, um, I know I know his, uh, you know his pay is part of the budget, but it seemed like when uh, Sergeant Boyd explained it to us that some of his pay was out of the grant. Yeah, Previously, $65,000 a year uh, okay, so was reimbursed was, to the so, city. So, so then the payroll of the police officers, they went up this year. Yes, okay. that's correct. Yeah. Yes. Of the police department. Yes, please. <laughs> yeah. All right. I make the motion to eliminate the uh, ICAC funding from the contractual services with the police department uh, budget in the amount of $27,200. And that was account number 445050. Um, I will verify that that number is correct. Um, but I believe it is just looking at what I have here. Uh, Four four five four five zero. There has been a motion to eliminate the IAC uh, funding from the uh, support riverboat by Councilman Dabney support. and seconded by Councilman Fitzpatrick. Is there any further? Discussion? Is there any public, anyone from the public wish to speak on this amendment? Rodney McCormick, 617 Union Street, Michigan City. Um, I'm offended as a citizen who has been abused and just treated like, just, just treated bad by this police department. I want to first say that you guys should have invited John Lake, County, LaPorte County Prosecutor here along with the sheriff. You had the sheriff here, you had the chief here. But you should have understood why John Lake removed this and did not want to have nothing to do with this equipment. Back on November 2nd of last year, I was here in City Hall. One of the city council members was there with me. My phone was taken from me. They took my phone and rushed it to the Michigan City Police Department and started trying to open up another criminal investigation against me. They data dump my phone without a warrant. That is part of a federal lawsuit that will be filed within the next 30 days. 
after they data dumped my phone, after they data dumped my phone, they took it at 4, 440, 4.50 that, that p.m. They went, to a, they went to a judge to get a warrant. The judge denied them. Then they went to their favorite judge, Judge Bergeson, who was all friends with them. He signed the warrant. But they already did the data dump. There's, the county prosecutor should be here. Prior to that, Matthew Barr went in and swore an oath that I committed a crime of battery to Officer Babcock. It was all over the internet. He said that I touched him in a rude and insolent manner, which was battery. That Both charges, by the way, was dismissed. Matter of fact, there was no probable cause found in one. They came into my home, broke in my doors. They had AKs, they had their guns pointed at my kids at six something in the morning for a level six felony, which is the lowest felony possible. That's not a major felony, level six, despite what the chief wants to tell you. They took every laptop, every cell phone, anything that had anything to do with electronics, they took it out of my house. They data dumped everything. You don't, when you talk about when you just, when you said the, the license plate reader, Ms. Carnes, was dangerous, this equipment is serious. That It's very dangerous. They deleted my home security system that showed Matthew Barr lied. But we had it on iPads that they couldn't get into. I put it on social media, showed everybody, showed the judges. Case was dismissed. And then they hacked into my home security system. It was watching me. I didn't know this until we hired an IT person to come to my house to retrieve data from another security system that was in the attic that they didn't know about. That information will be released right before right before this next coming up election. This stuff is dangerous. Matthew Barr is a dangerous person. He's very dangerous. ICAT was meant for child predators. Our police department has been using it as against black citizens to profile us. Some of the equipment, some of the photos they took from individuals was done unlawfully. Individuals posing with guns in their hands, they used it and got them federal charges against them. But those individuals don't know that they was using the ICAT equipment to pull this off. We are in dangerous times right now. Nobody wants to hold the police department accountable. When are you going to hold them accountable? When are you going to stop this madness? When are you? We got all these unsolved murders in Michigan City right now today. Has ICAT done anything for them? It's only been used and all they do is target black people time and time and time again. And they want to continue doing it. Our old police chief here took it upon himself. Daryl Edwards, 27-year-old individual, was murdered in our city on Grace and Hobart. The person that murdered that man was released out of federal custody at the request of this police chief. That person went and that person was told to set individuals up. And he never could set an individual up because you know what he did? He ended up killing somebody. And now he's back in federal custody. All I want to say to this is this. You can do whatever you want to do. I'm glad you gone. I'm glad you out of here. I am glad. I am glad you got order. Whatever you got to say, you can say it out there too. You're out of order, sir. I'm glad you're gone. You're out of order, sir. Four more meetings, partner. You're out of order, sir. You're out of order, sir. And I would request that you leave the council chambers. Four more meetings, you done. And I hope they vote you out of office too. See you next meeting. Now y'all finna listen to him stand up and lie. And that's exactly what he's gonna do. Because you're nothing but a liar and a racist. Sir, 
Leave the chambers, please. Sir, motion to adjourn. Please leave the chambers. Motion to Okay, who made, who made the motion? Who made the motion to adjourn? I did. Mr. Fritz. You got a vote on the court. That's a motion and a second. We got a vote. We got a vote on that. Great. Is he going to remove his motion? No. Okay. Mr. Myers, Mr. Myers, there was a motion to adjourn. There's a second. Okay. Are you Do we vote? We vote on that. Adjourning the rest of the night, or are you talking about adjourning for ten minutes? I don't know. What are, what are we talking? Adjourn until we can come back when it's a more civil time. This budget has to be approved prior to. It's not the end of the month. Well, then we have a special council meeting. I can agree with that. Okay. Okay. There's, uh, right there, that. there's been a motion to adjourn and a second, and with the understanding that there will be, and I can add into the motion, uh, that we'll, we will have a special council meeting held so we can take care of the rest of the business. Uh, all those in favor of adjourning signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Nay. 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 How many? Pull the council. Let's sign up on the vote, please. Okay. Um, Mr. Fitzpatrick. Aye. Mr. Hamilton. Nay. Mr. Presbolinski. Aye. Don Presbolinski. Aye. Mr. Paul Presbolinski. Aye. Mr. Simmons. Aye. Mr. Stemley. Nay. Mr. Beatry. Nay. Mr. Dabney. Aye. And Ms. Carnes. Nay. We have five in favor and four opposed. Meeting is adjourned. Meeting is adjourned.